The Royal Commission into Violence, Abuse, Neglect and Exploitation of People with Disability is now in session. Good morning, uh, everybody. Um, I would like uh, to welcome everyone who is joining or who will join this, which is the 26th uh, public hearing of the Royal Commission into Violence, Abuse, Neglect and Exploitation of People with Disability. This is a five-day hearing and is being conducted at the Park Royal Hotel in Parramatta. The evidence during this week uh, will concentrate uh, on the experiences of people with disability who have been homeless or are at risk of homelessness. For example, why, while living in boarding houses or other forms of insecure housing. I'm pleased to say that uh, for this week, members of the public uh, are free to attend the hearing in person. Although of course, it's open to anyone to follow the proceedings on the live stream if they wish. On behalf of the uh, Royal Commission, I wish to acknowledge the Darug people, the traditional custodians of the land upon which this hearing takes place. We wish to pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And we also pay our respects uh, to all First Nations people attending the hearing in person today, uh, as well as those who uh, may be following the proceedings on the main stream. The first part of this hearing will hear experiences of people with disability in New South Wales who have been homeless uh, or who live or have lived in insecure accommodation such as the boarding houses I have just mentioned. The second part of the hearing will uh, focus on a category of regulated boarding houses in Victoria known as supported residential services, SRSs. The SRS sector has been the subject of criticism by the Victorian Ombudsman and the Victorian Public Advocate. Among other things, uh, this hearing will be considering whether and to what extent people with disability, particularly people with intellectual or psychosocial disability, are at an increased risk of homelessness, whether experiencing homelessness makes it more difficult for a person with disability to find and remain in safe, accessible and secure accommodation, and whether insecure accommodation exposes people with disability to a greater risk of violence, abuse, neglect or exploitation. At this hearing, I'm joined in the Parramatta hearing room by Commissioner John Ryan AM, who's on my left, Commissioner Rhonda Galbally, who can be seen on the screen, Commissioner Galbally AC, is participating in the hearing remotely from uh, Melbourne. Senior Counsel assisting the Royal Commission, Ms Kate Eastman, AMSC, and Ms Elizabeth Bennett, SC, are in the hearing room in Parramatta. They appear with uh, Ms Cathy Dowsett and Mr Ben Fogarty of Counsel, also in the Commission hearing room. This week, the Royal Commission will hear evidence from approximately 27 witnesses, most of whom will give their evidence in person. Ms Eastman uh, will shortly provide more details about the witnesses and the evidence they are to give in her opening statement. A number of parties have been given leave to uh, appear at this hearing, and I will take appearances from their representative shortly. I hope I might be forgiven uh, for uh, offering a personal reflection on the subject matter of this hearing. In 1974, 48 years ago, as the Commissioner for Law and Poverty on the Australian Government Commission of Inquiry into Poverty, which was chaired by Professor Ronald Henderson, I wrote a research report on homeless people and the law. That report formed a chapter in uh, my final report on law and poverty in Australia, that uh, was published, uh, presented in uh, 1975 by a masterpiece of timing. It was presented three weeks before the dismissal of the Labor government. The Law and Poverty Report focused on the use of the criminal law, principally through the offences of public drunkenness and vagrancy as a means in effect of uh, penalising poverty. The report did not specifically concentrate on disability as a cause of homelessness, 
This was 17 years before the Disability Discrimination Act was passed by the Australian Parliament. But the report pointed out that homeless people were much more likely than the general population to have what these days would be described as a psychosocial disability. The report argued that uh, the criminal law had been applied in a discriminatory fashion against the poorest people in the community, including First Nations people, especially, of course, those experiencing homelessness. The Law and Poverty Report recommended that the states and territories repeal laws criminalising vagrancy and public drunkenness. In due course, most jurisdictions did exactly that. But that wasn't the end of the story. Police were later given powers by state and territory legislatures to detain people found in public places, allegedly for their own protection. The 1991 Aboriginal Deaths in Custody Royal Commission, for example, found that many First Nations people had died in custody after being placed in protective police custody for public drunkenness. Deaths of this kind did not stop in 1991. In New South Wales, police move on powers introduced in 2002 have been used in ways similar to the old public drunkenness or vagrancy laws. In 2016, the New South, Wales, New South Wales Ombudsman found that uh, consorting offences, which had recently been introduced, that is, offences involving consorting with known criminals, had been used to isolate and exclude, uh, socially isolate and exclude homeless people, including First Nations people and people with cognitive impairments. My purpose in referring to the re-emergence of uh, laws and practices that can penalise homeless people a high proportion of whom are people with disability, is to show that uh, history has a habit of repeating itself, often in a different guise. This has occurred even though Australian, the Australian government and state and territory governments have treated the problem of homelessness very much more seriously in recent decades than in earlier times, and have devoted very considerable resources to reducing the incidence of homelessness and to supporting people at risk of homelessness. The history that I have very briefly described is a reminder that the process of analysing evidence, identifying policy issues, and proposing reforms capable of bringing about transformational change is not a simple process. Even if recommendations are accepted by governments, <clears throat> reforms are not as self-executing. They not only have to be implemented, whether by legislation or changes to policies and practices, but they also have to be carefully monitored over time to ensure that they are achieving their objectives and not being undermined for one reason or another. In short, reform is always a work in progress. Exhibit one is the NDIS. The most significant provisions of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities for the purposes of this hearing are Articles 19 and 28 of the Convention. Article 19 recognises the equal right of all persons with disabilities to live in the community with choices equal to others. This includes the opportunity to choose their place of residence and where and with whom they live on an equal basis with others, to have access to uh, community support services, including personal assistance necessary to support living and inclusion in the community, and to prevent isolation or segregation, and the right to access community services and facilities on an equal basis to the general population. Article 28 of the Convention recognises the right of persons with disabilities to an adequate standard of living, including adequate housing and a continuous improvement of living conditions. The realisation of this right require state parties to ensure, among other things, access by persons with disabilities to public housing programs without discrimination on the basis of disability. Evidence that will be given by representatives of the Department of Social Services at this hearing will say that governments in Australia, including the Australian government, intend to fulfil their, quote, progressively realisable obligations under the CRPD, unquote, through first the provision of social and affordable housing, 
Secondly, action under Australia's Disability Strategy 2021-2031. Thirdly, the implementation of the National Construction Code 2022. And fourthly, the NDIS. One issue for consideration at this hearing is whether other steps are needed to reduce the risk of violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation to which people with disability are exposed if they become homeless or are at risk of homelessness. These days we have considerably more data than in 1974 about the extent of homelessness among people with disability in Australia and uh, data about the number of people with disability at risk of homelessness, although the data is still far from complete. The starting point is the 2016 census, which estimated on the basis of a variety of indicators that over 116,000 people were homeless on census night. The comparable figure for the 2021 census is not yet available. The Australian Bureau of Statistics has estimated on the basis of 2016 census data that about 10,200 people with severe or profound disability had experienced some form of homelessness during the year. Data from multiple sources indicates that despite the actions of Australian state, Commonwealth and Territory governments and other agencies, people with disability, especially intellectual disability, are considerably more likely than people without a disability to experience homelessness or to be at risk of homelessness. Information that has been provided by the National Disability Insurance Agency, the NDIA, and which will form part of the evidence, shows that the number of national the NDIS participants who self-reported that they had been homeless during the last three years was as follows. During the 2019-2020 year, 1,016 participants. During the 2020-2021 year, 1,368 participants. And during the most recent year, 2021 to 2022, 1,594 NDIS, NDIS participants. The NDIA considers that NDIS participants are at risk of homelessness if they are living in a hostel, a boarding house, or a private hotel, or in short-term crisis accommodation. When NDIS participants at risk of homelessness in accordance with this, this definition, are added to the participants reporting that they had actually been homeless, the totals for the same three years are as follows. 2019 to 2020, 4,592 participants, either homeless or at risk of homelessness. 2020 to 2021, 5,712 NDIS participants. 2021 to 2022, 6,306 participants. These numbers represent, it is true, a relatively small percentage of the total of NDIS participants, but the numbers are nonetheless substantial. In considering the numbers, it has to be remembered that the objectives of the NDIS Act 2013 include giving effect to Australia's obligations under the CRPD, supporting the independence and social and economic participation of people with disability, and promoting the provision of high quality and innovative supports that enable people with disability to maximise independent lifestyle and, for, and full inclusion in the community. It's also to be remembered that the NDIS allocates very large sums of money to support people with disability to find and remain in safe, secure and accessible accommodation. There is, of course, absolutely no reason to doubt that the NDIS has greatly enhanced the lives of many of the 534,655 active participants as at 30 June 2022. Even so, to have over 6,000 NDIS participants either experiencing homelessness or at risk of homelessness is a significant social problem that demands attention. Of course, 
NDIS participants are not the only people with disability who experience homelessness or are at risk of homelessness. Additional data will be presented during this hearing to provide a more complete picture of people with disability who are homeless or at risk of homelessness. This is the first public hearing to investigate specifically the experiences of people with disability who are homeless or at risk of homelessness. But as we have emphasised throughout this Royal Commission, all of our hearings are connected in one way or another. We are now moving towards the end of our exceptionally demanding hearing program. And as we do, I hope that the connections are becoming clearer. We have received evidence about people with disability experiencing homelessness or being at risk of homelessness in a number of hearings. For example, public hearing three on the experiences of uh, living in a group home for people with disability, heard how the process of deinstitutionalization, particularly following the Richmond report in the 1980s, produced a dramatic increase in the number of people with disability who became homeless or were taken into custody by the authorities one way or another. There are lessons here about the ever-present danger of reforms producing unintended consequences. Public hearing four on health services for people with cognitive disability received evidence about a First Nations man with disability from a remote community who was discharged from hospital after an operation into homelessness. He was left without assistance to return to country and to community. Public hearing six examined the use of psychotropic medication, behaviour support and so, uh, in relation to so-called behaviours of concern. The Royal Commission heard evidence that some people with disability who display serious behaviours of concern become homeless because service providers simply relinquish support. There was also evidence that people with complex support needs were sometimes left at local hospitals by their accommodation service providers with nowhere to go after being discharged. Public Hearing 11 examined the experiences of people with cognitive disability in the criminal justice system. We heard directly from people with disability who had experienced homelessness and transient living arrangements for prolonged periods of time. One witness described how her life transformed or was transformed once she had stable accommodation. She said, quote, being homeless, it has caused so much harm. It is so harmful not to have somewhere safe, you know, affordable to live. At public hearing 14, the Royal Commission examined the provision of disability services in South Australia by a state-run disability accommodation provider and it also examined governmental responses to the tragic death of Ms. anne Marie Smith, of which many of you will have heard. Evidence was given about the joint efforts of the NDIA and the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission to develop a so-called vulnerable participants framework, which identifies as a risk factor for abuse associated with crisis accommodation or in a boarding house or shelter, or experiencing homelessness, unquote. Commissioners also received evidence at that hearing about the importance of providers of last resort being available when a person with disability is at risk of becoming homeless. This can happen, for example, when no provider is willing or able to provide the supported accommodation to a person with disability. The Royal Commission is now about to enter the last year of its life. We face a truly formidable task in preparing a final report which analyzes the hearings identified at hearings. We will have held by the end of this year, 2022, 32 public hearings, dealing with an extraordinary range of topics and issues. Uh, the final report will need to explore the connections between the hearings and, of course, other information that has come to the attention of the Royal Commission. As with so many of the topics we have investigated, homelessness and insecure and unsafe housing for people with disability 
are very closely linked with other aspects of our work. I hope that the final report will make those links clear. I shall now take appearances. Thank you, Commissioners. My name is Kate Eastman. I appear as counsel assisting the Royal Commission with Miss Elizabeth Bennett, SC, Miss Cathy Dowsett, and Mr. Ben Fogarty. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Eastman. Uh, I think there's an appearance from the Commonwealth. Thank you, Chair. I appear. I think it might. So you know, the vast resources of the Commonwealth should be able to provide you with your own microphone. I, I thought I had a microphone at the table, uh, Chair. Ms. Morgan, I appear with the Commonwealth. Yes, thank Ms. you. Ms. Robinson. Thank you, Ms. Morgan. There's an appearance, I think, for the, univer <laughs> the university, for the state of New South Wales. Uh, there is. My name's Gail Furness, and I appear with Trent Glover, thank instructed you. by the Crown Solicitor's Office for the state of New South Wales. Thank you, Ms. Furness. Um, I think there's an appearance remotely for the state of Queensland. Yes, good morning, um, yes, Chair. Good morning. My name is Chair, Chief's Council, appearing uh, instructed by Crown Law. Yes, thank you. You broke up a little, but I assume it's Ms. McMillan who's appearing for the state of Queensland. Thank you. Yes. And I think Please there's. I think there's an appearance to be announced for the state of Victoria. Yes, uh, if the Commission pleases, my name is Claire Harris, and I appear for the state of Victoria. Thank you very much. Uh, I shall wait a moment to see if there are any other appearances. I don't think there are. Yes, Ms. Eastman. Thank you, um, Commissioners. As Council Assisting, we also acknowledge the traditional custodians on the lands on which we are meeting today and across Australia. We pay our respects to First Nations elders, past, present and emerging, as well as to all First Nations people following this public hearing. Commissioners, housing has been raised at every public hearing of this Royal Commission. Chair, you've mentioned some of the hearings this morning Commissioners, you have heard evidence from people with disability about their homes, living arrangements, about inaccessible dwellings and substandard conditions of hygiene. You have heard about the importance of choice and control about where a person lives and who they live with. People with disability and their families have told you about threats of eviction and the fear of losing their accommodation. You have heard about the importance of secure accommodation being essential to enable people with disability to undertake employment, to feel secure and participate in the community. You have heard about the impact on women with disability who experience family and domestic violence, rendering them homeless. At the recent public hearing in Alice Springs, you heard about the experience of First Nations people with disability with respect to the lack of housing, overcrowded homes and inaccessible dwellings. In December 2019, the Royal Commission held public hearing number three concerning the experience of people with disability living in group homes. At that hearing, you heard that deinstitutionalisation in Australia coincided with an increase in the number of people with disability who became homeless or incarcerated in prisons. People with disability have also provided submissions to the Royal Commission describing how they became homeless or their experiences living without a home and supports. They've told you about the experience of being discharged from hospitals, mental health facilities and prisons into unsupported accommodation. They have told you about having to live in a hospital, sleeping rough, living in a car, staying in hotels, caravan parks and boarding houses where some have experienced violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation. People with disability have also made submissions about the impact of public emergencies, including the COVID pandemic and the recent floods in New South Wales and the impact these events have had on their housing and supports. 
people with disability who have made these submissions reflect a diverse group. They live, in a wide, they live with a wide range of different disabilities and come from different socio and uh, demographic groups. Their experiences also include a range of interactions with all level of government, with social housing, with private sector housing as tenants and homeowners. Their experiences reflect the findings of other public inquiries and research. As the commissioners are aware, the Royal Commission's terms of reference require the commissioners to have regard to past reports and past recommendations. The recent House of Representatives Standing Committee on Social Policy and Legal Affairs presented its report, an inquiry into homelessness in Australia. It found people with disability are at a greater risk of housing stress and homelessness. It also found that they face additional barriers to accessing support and housing services. The committee made a number of recommendations and identified the need for an increased focus on prevention and early intervention to address homelessness in Australia. The recent Royal Commission into Victoria's mental health system found that safe and affordable housing plays a central role in supporting people to live well with a sense of safety, security and belonging. The recent Victorian parliamentary inquiry into homelessness in its report highlighted that many people seeking homelessness services in Victoria rely on Commonwealth income support such as Job Seeker or the Disability Support Pension. The academic research is rich and it identifies a large number of issues. I'll just touch on a few. The research tells us that people with disability are at a greater risk of experiencing homelessness, that disability is considered one of the several risk factors for experiencing homelessness, the people who experience chronic homelessness have higher rates of cognitive impairment, traumatic brain injury, serious physical health problems, a history of abuse or trauma and psychosocial disability. The research identified, for example, that in June 2020, there were 141,000 social housing households that included a person with disability of these households, 40% uh, were households for people with disability and the greatest proportions representing public housing followed by community housing and state owned and managed indigenous housing. The research also tells us that the pathways into and out of homelessness are just as varied and can be influenced by disability type, location and the level of a person's disability. I want to turn to experiencing homelessness. This public hearing will examine the experiences of people with disability of homelessness and living in boarding houses, hostels and insecure housing. A starting point is to ask what does it mean to be homeless and what is the prevalence of homelessness for people with disability? There is no clear or consistent definition of homelessness used in Australia. We'll hear from the witnesses this week that they don't identify by reference to a definition, they speak to their experiences. But the Australian Bureau of Statistics says definitions of homelessness are culturally and historically contingent. The ABS says that they range from limited objective measures which conflate homelessness with rooflessness or to more equivocal subjective definitions founded on culturally and historically determined ideas of what it means to have a home. In 2012, the ABS developed a statistical definition of homelessness to use in its work. And it defines homelessness as follows. When a person does not have suitable accommodation alternatives, they are considered homeless if their current living arrangement, one, is a dwelling, is in a dwelling that is inadequate, two, has no tenure, or if their initial tenure is short or not extendable and does not allow them to have control of or access to space for social relations. 
the ABS acknowledges that there are limitations using this def definition with respect to the census data to estimate homelessness because of the risk of under or over estimation and under enumeration of people in the census. The ABS says observing homeless people in any data collection is a challenge and their homelessness circumstances may mean that people are not captured in all data sets to count people generally, that count people generally. The ABS also acknowledges that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are overrepresented in the measures of homelessness developed with this particular definition. And they're likely to be additional aspects of homelessness for First Nations people with their perspectives and that the definition does not currently capture the including high rates of residential mobility or living remotely in the bush on country. For the most recent census in 2021, the ABS records that one in 200 people in Australia are experiencing homelessness. It records that 116,000 people are homeless every night, including those sleeping on streets across Australia. The previous census of 2016 identified around 5,700 people with disability being defined as people with a need for assistance with core activities were experiencing hopelessness and people with disability represented about 5% of all homeless people. The census also recorded that people with severe or profound disability were overrepresented among uh, certain forms of marginal housing, while representing around 5% of all homeless people, those uh, who were homeless because of disability were disproportionately represented in the following areas. 12% were in supported accommodation for homeless people. 12% were marginally housed in caravan parks. 9% in temporary lodgings and 8% living in boarding houses. There are other definitions and the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, which receives and aggregates data from 1600 specialist homeless services agencies across Australia on a monthly basis, uses a different definition to the ABS. The specialist homeless services identify a person as being homeless if they are living in, non-conventional accommodation or sleeping rough, and that's defined as living on the streets, sleeping in parks, squatting, staying in cars or railway carriages, living in improvised dwellings or living in, long, in the long grasses. Or it could be short-term or emergency accommodation due to the lack of other options. And that includes refuges, crisis shelters, couch surfing, living temporarily with friends and relatives or insecure accommodation such as emergency accommodation, hotels, motels and boarding houses. The Australian Institute of Health and Welfare's key findings about their clients with disability for the year 2020 to 2021 reveals that there were 7,000 of the clients who identified with disability. Of those 7,000 clients, 66% had previously been assisted by the Specialist Homeless Services Agency at some point in the past 10 years. And the majority of clients with disability were alone and not part of a family. Can I now turn to the question of human rights and a human rights perspective on the experience of homelessness? From a human rights perspective, experiencing homelessness means not having stable, safe and adequate housing or the means and ability of obtaining it. The United Nations Special Rapporteur on the right to adequate housing says this. Homelessness is a profound assault on dignity, social inclusion and the right to life. It is a prima facie violation of the right to housing and violates a number of other human rights in addition to the right to life, including non-discrimination, health, water and sanitation, security of the person 
and freedom from cruel, degrading and inhuman treatment. The special rapporteur has said, the experience of homelessness will not be fully captured unless the definition goes beyond the deprivation of physical shelter. Reducing the definition to merely putting a roof over someone's head will fail to take into account the loss of social connection, a feeling of belonging nowhere, and the social exclusion experienced by people living in homelessness. Commissioners, the right to an adequate standard of living, including adequate housing, is recognised as a core social human right. It is integrally connected to the enjoyment of many human rights. And Chair, this morning you referred to both Article 19 and Article 28 of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Article 28 recognises the right of people with disability to an adequate standard of living for themselves and their families, including adequate housing. And in particular, Article 28 requires states to take measures to ensure access by people with disability to public housing programs. At public hearing three, commissioners, you examined the nature and scope of Article 19 of the CRPD. Chair, as you've said, it recognises the right of people with disability to live independently and to be included in the community. This right includes the opportunity for people with disability to choose their place of residence and where and with whom they live on an equal basis with others and not to be obliged to live in particular living arrangements. It also includes the right to access to a range of in-home, residential and other community support services, including personal assistance necessary to support living and inclusion in the community and to prevent isolation or segregation from the community. We note, Commissioners, the preparation of your Commissioner's Hearing Report for Public Hearing 3 a copy of that report is available on the Royal Commission's website and you address the operation of Article 19 in some detail. This Royal Commission's work is guided by the CRPD and importantly, how those rights in the CRPD can be practically and effectively implemented in Australian laws and policies. Chair, you might recall asking the question of Dr Ian Weissel during his evidence at public hearing three, you asked him this. What would the system look like if Article 19 were to be fully implemented? What would have to be done? You'll remember this question was asked in December 2019. He said, we would need a program, a national program to build a supply of affordable housing. And I'm talking at a scale of 100,000 new homes. This is just for NDIS participants, excluding many other people with disability who are not NDIS participants and live in substandard housing or live in private residential, uh, I think, accommodation, experiencing affordable stress, which means paying half their income on the rent. So a national plan to build 100,000 at least new homes that are affordable to people to pay no more than 25% of their income on rent is the first step. And he said, I don't see any such policy being proposed. Commissioners, this week, you will have the opportunity to hear whether Australian housing and homelessness policies and strategies are designed to meet Australia's human rights obligations or whether a human rights approach informs housing policy. I'll start then with the Australia, Australia's disability strategy. This week, we will ask representatives of the Australian government why homelessness was not addressed in Australia's disability strategy 2021 to 2031, that strategy being launched in December last year. Australia's disability strategy highlights two priority areas in relation to housing for people with disability. One, the, to increase the availability of afford affordable housing. And secondly, that housing is accessible and people with disability have choice and control about where they live, who they live with, and who comes into their home. 
the strategy does not contain a priority or action item related to homelessness for people with disability. Another important strategy is the National Housing and Homelessness Agreement. We will ask the Australian government why people with disability are not currently a priority cohort in the National Housing and Homelessness Agreement. This agreement commenced on the 1st of July 2018 and it's due to end on the 30th of June 2023, but it's expected that it will be extended through to 30 June 2024. The Australian government provides around $1.6 billion each year to states and territories to improve access to secure and affordable housing across the housing spectrum. In the 2020-2021 budget, the agreement included $129 million for homelessness services, which were to be matched by the states and territories. There was no specific funding identified for people with disability who experience homelessness. Under the agreement, there are six housing priority areas and the agreement identifies six priority homelessness cohorts. These cohorts may include people with disability, but there is no specific priority uh, cohort identified specifically to, in, to capture people with disability. The agreement provides that state and territory governments may identify other priority cohorts in their respective bilateral agreements and there'll be an opportunity over the course of this week to ask New South Wales and Victoria with respect to their arrangements. The agreement also requires state and territory governments to make their housing and homelessness strategies publicly available and to contribute to improved data collection and reporting in order to receive funding. A data improvement plan for 2019 to 2023 details agreed data improvements and a schedule, but the plan is silent on in any indicators or agreed outcomes specifically related to people with disability. Now, Commissioners, you are also aware that the Australian Productivity Commission is reviewing the agreement. And among other things, the review is considering the extent to which the agreement is meeting the obligations of government under Australia's disability strategy. Now, we've checked the website and we understand the Productivity Commission will hand its report to the Australian government on Wednesday this week. Chair, you've made some um, observations about the role of the National Disability Insurance Scheme and the Quality and Safeguards Commission. This week, you'll hear from the NDIA about its role in supporting participants who are homeless or at risk of homelessness and the supports to enable them to, sue, to secure accessible, safe and sustainable housing. Now, Chair, you mentioned some figures this morning and as you were speaking, we received an updated uh, schedule of those numbers and um, perhaps when Ms Short gives her evidence later in the week, we'll come to those numbers and make sure that they reflect the correct numbers. Uh, but the NDIA says that it is aware of the participants who are homeless or at risk of homelessness being the type of participants who might disengage with the services, supports and networks. And one of the issues we'll explore during the course of this week are the measures used by the NDIA to connect with such participants. Later this week on Friday, you'll hear from the National Disability Insurance Quality and Safeguards Commission about its role and the measures taken by it with respect to service providers who provide supports and services to people with disability living in boarding houses and hostels. So can I now turn to this hearing? This hearing will be led by people with disability who will share their personal experiences of homelessness and insecure housing. The first part of this hearing will focus on New South Wales and people with disability will tell you about their personal experiences. Commissioners in preparation for the hearing, the staff of the Royal Commission have engaged with people with disability who have a wide range of experiences concerning housing and homelessness. 
we have visited a range of homelessness services and places for crisis accommodation. And in particular, we acknowledge and thank the Haymarket Foundation and the Newtown Neighbourhood Centre. Our commissioners, over the course of the next three days, we will present some pre-recorded oral evidence from our visits, in particular to the Newtown Neighbourhood Centre. And you'll hear from Jack, William, Christmas and Dave. Shortly, you'll hear from Charlotte. Charlotte is 61 and she has prepared a statement that I'll read with her. She will her, share her experiences of living out of home and then in institutions. She lived in a boarding house for about 15 years where she experienced significant violence, abuse and neglect. She will tell you that she thought living in jail would be preferable to living in the boarding house. Charlotte has now lived in public housing for the last 25 years and she will tell you about the importance of stable housing, secure supports and making her own decisions. You'll also hear from Dawn and Dawn is already here in the hearing room and thank you Dawn for coming today. Um, I don't know whether I should say your age Dawn but you're probably in your 70s and uh, Dawn lives in a boarding house in Sydney. We met Dawn at the Newtown Neighbourhood Centre and Dawn pre-recorded uh, a conversation with me some time ago and we'll play that, but you'll also have the opportunity to hear from Dawn this morning. She'll talk about different housing services, accessing services and her experiences during the COVID lockdown. Later today, you'll hear from Colin, he's 58, and he lives with disability and he currently uses a wheelchair. He's worked most of his adult life running his own business in regional New South Wales. In February 2022, he was living in his sister's house. His sister lives with disability and Colin was supporting her. He will tell you about the experience of the rising waters having to be rescued and surviving the Lismore flood. He has experienced homelessness as a result of the flood, and he is now constantly moving from one temporary form of accommodation to another, with no medium or long-term accommodation on the horizon for him. Tomorrow, you'll hear from Nicola Morehouse. She lives with visual snow syndrome, and she has two teenage daughters who are neurodiverse. She faced imminent homelessness when she was evicted from her private rental property in Newcastle, and she was initially unable to find suitable alternative rental accommodation, including social housing, that was within her budget and also met her accessibility requirements. She will tell you about the lack of affordable and accessible housing for people with disability, problems with the linkages between the NDIS and social housing, and how difficult it is to navigate the social housing system, even with knowledgeable and protective, sorry, proactive NDIS support coordinator. Also tomorrow, you'll hear from Claudia. She's 25 and she lives in a regional part of New South Wales. Claudia has a physical disability, which has required many painful surgeries throughout her childhood, adolescence, and now into adulthood. She experienced family violence as a young person and her experiences of homelessness started when she was 16 years old. They included couch surfing, staying out all night and sleeping in a car. Claudia lives in foyer accommodation and she'll tell you about that. Secure housing has enabled Claudia to undertake tertiary studies and engage in youth homelessness advocacy. Commissioners, the evidence of people with disability is likely to identify a number of systemic issues, including, first, a lack of affordable, suitable and accessible housing for people with disability and an over-reliance on crisis and temporary accommodation. Secondly, how people with disability can slip between the service provider and sector cracks leading them into homelessness. Thirdly, the value of, a value of attaining safe, secure and sustainable housing. Fourthly, the need for ongoing wraparound support for people with complex support needs to sustain a tenancy. 
Fifth, the additional barriers faced by people with disability when trying to engage and interact with mainstream service systems, such as the public housing system and the NDIS. And uh, next then, the problems with integration and coordination between agencies, support services and sectors. And finally, for the NDIS participants, the role the NDIS plays or should play in supporting participants who are homeless or at risk of homelessness to find secure and then sustainable permanent housing. Commissioners, you'll also have the opportunity to hear from the frontline services. Tomorrow you'll hear from representatives from three peak homelessness sector bodies, Homelessness New South Wales, NEMI and Mission Australia. Commissioners, you will hear this week that there is a disconnection between the policies and strategies to address homelessness and those that address and support people with disability in New South Wales. The sector witnesses are likely to tell you that we know or we don't know about people with disability in the homelessness sector in New South Wales. What the structural system and attitudinal individual barriers are that prevent people with disability who are experiencing or at risk of homelessness, uh, the opportunity to secure appropriate and accessible long-term housing. You're likely to hear that there may be some proven models, programs and projects, as well as strategies of intervention and support that can tackle and bring down the barriers for people with disability. And we'll also ask these sector uh, representatives, what their visions are for housing and homelessness for people with disability in New South Wales in 20 years time. You'll also hear from the New South Wales government and New South Wales has a suite of homelessness and social housing policies covering emergency circumstances, boarding houses and social housing. The New South Wales Homelessness Strategy 2018 to 2023 refers to a range of different cohorts. It includes people with mental health issues, but not people with disability generally, and will ask the question why. You will hear, for example, in New South Wales that as at 30 June 2021, there were almost 50,000 applicants on the New South Wales Housing Register. 22, about 22% of the applicants are people who live with disability, and that's defined as where the household head's main source of income is a disability support pension. We want to ask about waiting times for access to social housing. You're likely to hear that the median waiting time for priority approved applicants for public housing in the year 2020 to 2021 was 2.2 months, but the maximum waiting time for a priority approved applicant could be as much as 15 years. With respect to the uh, suite of policies and practices in New South Wales, we'll examine the eligibility for priority assistance in housing will examine the making of modifications to premises to improve accessibility. We'll ask about programs to support people with disability, for example, special rebates. And we'll also ask about eligibility for longer fixed term tenancies that may be available for people with disability. And we'll touch on the eligibility for private rental subsidies. And commissioners, as you've mentioned, the second part of this hearing will focus on Victoria. So on Thursday and Friday this week, we'll turn our attention to aspects of Victoria's policies and practices in relation to homelessness. Victoria also has, has a suite of homelessness and social housing policy covering emergency circumstances, boarding houses and social housing. In particular, we will examine the experiences of people with disability living in supported residential services in Melbourne, which is a hostel form of accommodation. And you will hear from people with disability and their family members about living in what will be using the expression SRS. We propose to make some additional opening comments to explain the nature of SRSs, 
the relevant regulatory arrangements and the actions taken by the Victorian government with respect to SRSs that have failed to meet regulatory standards. And we'll present those additional opening remarks on Thursday morning. Now up on the screen, you'll see that there is our content warning. The focus of this hearing is to listen to and to understand the experience of people with disability who've experienced homelessness and insecure housing. Some of the evidence will be distressing. So the Royal Commission encourages those watching, whether it be here in person or on the web stream, to be mindful that topics might be quite distressing and we encourage um, anyone to seek support in that respect. The numbers and the contact services are identified on the screen. Commissioners, for this public hearing, we will not ask the Royal Commission to make any adverse findings with respect to any individual experiences of people with disability. For this hearing, we will not uh, ask you or invite you to make findings as to whether a particular person, entity or agency has breached a law or breached a policy. The Royal Commission is not intended to be a substitute for the Commonwealth, State and Territory regulators for the conduct of coronial inquiries or to act as if it was a court or tribunal dealing with tenancy and homelessness issues. Now, finally, before we break, I just remind everyone following this proceeding, be it in the room or on the web stream, that there are provisions in the Royal Commissions Act that have a very clear object of protecting witnesses who give evidence before the Royal Commission. In particular, I want to draw attention to Section 6, capital M of that Act, which provides that any person who uses, causes or inflicts any violence, punishment, damage, loss or disadvantage to any person on account of the person having appeared as a witness, given evidence or produced documents to the Royal Commission, commits an indictable offence. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you, Ms Eastman. I will now take an adjournment and resume at 11.30. Thank you. The Royal Commission is adjourned. The Royal Commission is resumed. Yes, Ms. Uh, thank you, Commissioners. Our first witness is Charlotte. Charlotte is a pseudonym and Charlotte has already taken her affirmation. Charlotte, thank you very much for coming to the Royal Commission today to give evidence. We very much appreciate the help that you're giving us and uh, we look forward to hearing your evidence today. So. Thank you very much. If at any time you want to take a short break, you'll just let us know, and that can be done without any difficulty. Okay? Thank you very much. Yes, Ms. Commissioner. Commissioner, Charlotte's prepared a written statement, and as we were preparing for the hearing, Charlotte would like me to read her statement. I'll stop at different parts just to check in with Charlotte to make sure that I'm on track. And there are a few things Charlotte would like to talk to you about at the end of um, the statement. So commissioners, you have a copy of the statement in your bundle in part A1 behind tab one. This statement is made by me accurately, sets out the evidence that I am prepared to give to the Royal Commission into violence abuse, neglect and exploitation of people with disability. This statement is true and correct to the best of my knowledge and belief. There are a number of people I will refer to in this statement who I have given certain names to instead of using their full names. About me, I am a 61 year old woman. I was diagnosed with schizophrenia by the time I was 14 years old. 
I control this by taking medication. I have Charcot foot, which makes it difficult for me to walk. I use a walking frame and a wheelchair for longer distances. I also have custom footwear. I think I may also have an intellectual disability, but this has never been confirmed. I was in special classes at primary school and early high school. I need help with personal care, domestic tasks, and some day-to-day decision-making. I have help from my brother-in-law and from a range of service providers. My sister used to help me, but she began getting sick in 2016. My background. I have a long history of living out of the family home. When I was a child, I lived with my parents, my older sister and my older brother. We lived in a house in a northern suburb of Sydney. I had a good family. Some of my aunties and uncles lived close by and others lived around Sydney and New South Wales. When I was 12 years old, my sister got married and left home. My mum died when I was 23 years old and my aunties became like mothers to me. Every Mother's Day, I used to look for cards to send to my aunties. I didn't like school very much. It was hard and I was treated differently to other children. At first, I went to my local primary school, but due to my mental illness, I got moved to other primary schools further away from home. When I was around 13 years old, I started to show symptoms of schizophrenia. Because I was getting sick, I couldn't sleep. Mum and Dad would also be asleep and I would be out wandering around the neighbourhood in the early hours of the morning. There was not much support for my parents when I was a child. Mum was worried about my safety. She tried to get me into Rivendell, which is a mental health facility for young people, but they wouldn't take me because my schooling wasn't good enough. and I didn't want to go to year 12 at school. The only other option was Red Bank School, but at that time, you had to be a state ward to go there. So I had to go to Rydalmere Psychiatric Hospital. <clears throat> That's when the bad days began for me. As a young person living outside of the family home, I was vulnerable and often I did not feel safe. There was no help for me or mum. I knew it wasn't my mother's fault for putting me in Rydalmere and she tried the best she could. I got to go back to my parents' house from Rydalmere, but there wasn't enough help. I got sent to Chelmsford Hospital for a while, but mum took me out of there because it wasn't safe. The doctors were doing deep sleep therapy and people were dying. Mum used my auntie's address so that uh, she could get me into Hornsby Hospital because we didn't know what else to do. It was after I got sent home from Hornsby Hospital that Mum took me to Rin Minda Remand Centre. That's when I got made a state ward. It was all Mum could do to keep me safe. I was about 15 years old when I became a state ward. From Minda, I was sent to live in the Reby Training School near Campbelltown. I felt happy and safe there. They kept me busy. I went to night school where I learned to use how to use a switchboard. We also did physical education. In the main school, you slept in dormitories, but there were privileges cottage and you got more privacy and freedom, including your own room and the right to wear your own clothes. I went back to my parents' house after I finished at Reby School, but there wasn't much, sorry, there was still wasn't much help for my parents. 
One day, the police picked me up and took me to a psychiatric hospital. At first, I was under a temporary mental health act order for six months, and then I was made a permanent patient. I lived at various hospitals around Sydney, the Central Coast and Newcastle. I also spent time at a psychiatric rehabilitation ward in Newcastle, where I went to TAFE and learnt a lot. In one of the hospitals I lived in, I had 24 rounds of electroconvulsive therapy. I felt the hospital staff could do what they liked to me because I was on an order. I just remember them putting on the electroconvulsive equipment on my head and then I'd wake up. When I woke up, I wouldn't remember who I was or where I was. And it took a while to remember, it was scary. I'll just pause there, Charlotte, how are we going? Everything okay? Yes. Would you like me to keep going? Yes. After I was released from that hospital, I went to live in a boarding house in Stanmore, a suburb in inner west of Sydney. I lived here for around 15 years during the 1980s and 1990s. I will talk about my experiences at this house later on in my statement. While I was living at the boarding house, I spent some time at Gladesville Hospital. At Gladesville Hospital, I worked in an industrial therapy unit, an ITU, and that got me ready to work at a workshop. When I was working at the ITU, I was paid $38.50 per week. I've always known that I was different and I've been on a disability pension since 1981. I haven't been able to work a regular job, but working at the workshop was the closest thing I had to a proper job. Staff at that workshop were the ones that helped me get to live by myself. The workshop I worked at was in Redfern. It was called a sheltered workshop. I did piece work at first. Sometimes the pay was good, depending on the job and how much work you did. This made the Redfern workshop one of the better paid workshops. After a while, things changed and I was getting paid about $80 a week, which was even better than the piece work pay. To me, $80 per week was a lot of money. Depending on how, mu how much you earned from work, the housing department put your rent up as well. And Centrelink took money uh, out of you if you earned more than about $60 a week. I didn't get paid enough for the housing department to put up my rent. My experience living in a boarding house. Life at the boarding house was terrible. It was like a prison. We were treated horribly by the staff and the owner. I had no control over my life and no privacy. The boarding house was privately owned. The owner lived in the boarding house to start with, but then moved out and got his own house. It was a very big old house with lots of rooms. The house is still there, but it has been done up and it is no longer a boarding house. I don't know how many people were living there when I lived there. Some people lived in shared rooms. Others lived in dormitories and lots of men lived in the chapel. If you had a bedroom of your own, you had to pay more rent. It was pretty expensive to live there. I don't know how much because the staff used to take money from my savings as well. The pension wasn't very much back then and I would only have $2 a day left over. I couldn't even afford to pay for my glasses and my sister had to pay for them. When I first went there, it was good. The place was kept spotless and the food was good. 
There was the owner of the boarding house, a manager and other staff. Once the manager left and the owner got rid of the cleaner, things started to go downhill. At one stage, uh, there were live-in staff, but the owner got rid of them and we didn't have staff staying overnight. The owner then got new staff, but they didn't stay. And for a while, there was no staff working at the boarding house, only the owner. We had to do the cleaning and sometimes the owner would want me to clean up if someone had dirtied or vomited on the floor. There wasn't support at the boarding house. Everyone saw the same doctor who used to come to the house every week. Nearly every week, he got us all to sign his Medicare slip, whether or not he saw us, and he got me to sign a form whether or not I needed, whether I needed him or not. We were supposed to be fed three meals a day, but the food was terrible. The porridge was like dishwater and the sandwiches were horrible. When I was working in a kitchen at Redfern, my employers told me I could make a sandwich for lunch. So I used to make one for me and one for my friend, Andrew, because it was a lot better than the food at the boarding house where we lived. One night at the boarding house, we were given half a saveloy and a stale bread roll and were told it was dinner. About once a month or so, there were people from St. Vincent de Paul who would come and cook breakfast on a Sunday. That was the best food we had out of the whole lot. There were a mix of people at the boarding house. Some people weren't too bad, but other residents were not good. John used to light a lot of fires in the boarding house. John got the older residents to do not nice things. There are some bits I just can't tell anyone at all. There was also a resident of the boarding house who said he was a murderer. He said he was sent to hospital instead of jail and that he was let out after a couple of years to live in the boarding house with us. There were alcoholics living at the boarding house. It was like a mini institution. That's what it felt like to me, an institution. The boarding house is also where I met Andrew, who was my only friend there. We are still friends. He is like family. He used to come to dad's place with me and he used to come to my house and say, let's go visit dad today. Conditions of the boarding house. The boarding house was in very bad condition. A lot of things in the boarding house didn't work. For example, I often couldn't have a shower. The doors were broken, so you couldn't shut them when you were having a shower. When I could use the showers, I had to wear thongs because I never knew what I was going to tread in. I used to have to catch the train to my dad's house to have a shower. Or sometimes I went to Central Station to have a shower at the country trains because it was a lot cleaner than the boarding house showers. There were no doors on the toilets upstairs. There was one downstairs, but that was always water everywhere, so everything would get wet if you used it. Other people that lived there would sometimes go to the toilet on the floor and the owner would make me clean it up. If I didn't clean it up, he would hit me. I used to go to Stanmore Station if I needed to go to the toilet. I couldn't use the washing machine to wash my clothes because I didn't know what was going through the washing machine with my clothes or if they would come out clean. If I put my clothes in the dryer or hung them out to dry, other residents would steal my clothes. Although the boarding house provided linen, I had to ask my dad to give me sheets and blankets because we never knew how clean the sheets would be. The food at the boarding house was horrible. There were mice in the pantry and all over the boarding house. One of the staff from the boarding house did the cooking, but he was always drunk and the meals were disgusting. I couldn't sit 
in the day room because you didn't know what you would sit on. Other residents would wee on the seats. There was a woman who would sit at the table peeling herself while you were having your meal. Half the residents were scratching because they had head lice. All right, Charlotte, I'm just stopping there. How are we going? Yes. Keep going? Yes. Violence and abuse by staff. The managers and staff at the boarding house used to hit the residents. Samantha, one of the girls who worked in the boarding house kitchen, was really violent and abusive. Depending on how she felt, Samantha uh, would sometimes not give us breakfast or lunch. While I was at the boarding house, I worked at a workshop and every time I got paid, Samantha would be down at the station waiting for me and she would take all my money from me. Samantha would also take all of my pension money and I was left with $2 a day to live off. I was not the only person Samantha was taking money from at the boarding house. People would ask for their money back and Samantha would say no. Samantha would also take my clothes. Everything I had, she wanted. And if I didn't give it to her, she would hit me. The owner also hit residents. He had access to everyone's bank books and would make us sign a withdrawal form every fortnight so that he could withdraw money from our accounts. The owner used to be an accountant before he owned the boarding house. The owner would harass women. One time, he tried to get it on with my sister, but she wasn't interested. He was getting it on with one of the managers. Her husband was a police officer. And when he found out, he threatened to shoot the owner. No one believed us because none of it should have been happening. Misuse of medication. The staff at the boarding house used to drug us up on medication when we tried to complain about the conditions of the boarding house or the staff taking our money. One day, my friend came into the house when a staff member, Rose, was putting the money away. My friend asked for his money and was told no. The staff member who refused to give my friend money told another staff member, give him some medication to shut him up. Rose was not a doctor. I was on a lot of medication back then. I was drugged all the time. I was on 1200 milligrams of Lagatil 400 milligrams in the morning, at lunch and at night, plus lithium. I was also on 100 milligrams injection of Modicat once a week. There wasn't a mental health centre for adults then. I saw a psychiatrist sometimes. He was good, but the GP could do what he wanted with my medications. Violence in the house and wit witnessing the murder of my friend. There was a lot of violence in the boarding house. I don't think the owner cared who lived at the boarding house as long as he got his money. I was hit and raped while I was living there. One time I got hit so hard on the back of the head that it bled. I still get scared sometimes if people touch my head or brush my hair because it reminds me of being assaulted there. There was a lady in the boarding house who used to be up and down all night and would leave the front door open at night. I would get up and shut the door when she left it open. One night I didn't hear her leave the front door open and didn't get to shut it. I heard a scream from her bed. <clears throat> and I saw a man running out of her room. I think the man had tried to jump into bed with the lady. One of the staff who lived there came out with her son, Robert. Robert ran after the man. My friend Graham ran after Robert to make sure he was all right. I went after them and heard somebody yell out, look out, he's got a knife. It was too late. 
I watched the man stab Graham and Graham died. Watching Graham die has affected me greatly. And because of this, I am still afraid at night. Shall I just stop there, okay? All right. All right, yeah. keep going. Next topic, pregnancy, forced termination and sterilization. One manager of the boarding house had a boyfriend, Ian. He used to come to the boarding house to be with her, so he knew me from there. When they split up, Ian took me to live at his house. I told him I didn't like the boarding house, so he said I could live with him. But he just wanted a slave, and this was around 1984. No one said anything when I left the boarding house. The owner was on holidays, and there were only two staff working, Samantha and the one who used to steal my money, and her partner who was always drunk. At Ian's house, he used me and I was his slave. I was not at his house for long, but I was there long enough for him to abuse me. He was a psychiatric nurse. I should have been able to trust him. Back then, I just didn't know what to do. I didn't know what I was allowed to do. My mum knew about it and my sister knew about it but we didn't know what to do. I'm a bit afraid to talk to the police now. I've thought about it, but I don't know where Ian is or if it would change anything. I just want people to know what happened to us, what they did to us. After Ian abused me, I had to go back to the boarding house. No one asked me what happened or how I was. I still had my things, because I'd taken all my things with me to his house, but I couldn't have my room back, so I moved into a new room. When I was back at the boarding house, I had no idea uh, where I could go, where I, to go to leave there. I thought my only option was another boarding house. The next time the regular doctor came to the boarding house, I tried to tell him what had happened to me. He didn't listen, and he told me it was all in my mind. So a few weeks later, I decided to go to a different doctor at Stanmore. He did some tests and found out I was pregnant. When I came back for the results, he had the letter all written out for me to go to hospital. He didn't tell me I could go to the police or see a counsellor. They did not ask me what I wanted to do. They just sent me to a hospital with a letter saying, that I was to have a termination. The letter was already written and I had no choice. They said that if I didn't agree to having a termination, they would send me to a hospital under a Mental Health Act order and then they could make me have a termination anyway. I might not have wanted to have a child in that way, but I regret not being given the option I did not have a normal life after that termination. At hospital, I was also forced to be sterilised. Not long after the termination, I overdosed. It was on purpose. I wanted to die. I ended up at a Western suburbs hospital. Then they sent me to another under another mental health order. I stayed in that for a while and then I got sent back to the boarding house. That's when I lost my mum. Nowhere else to go. I hated the boarding house so much. I did not want to live there any longer, but I had nowhere else to go. I didn't know where to get help. I didn't know my name had dropped off the housing list. It wasn't until the program director at work told me about their houses that I knew there was another choice. Finally moving out of the boarding house. 
The program director at the workshop um, I worked in ran some houses that workers at my workshop were allowed to live in. My friend lived in one of these houses and they had a spare bedroom, which I moved into. It was a three bedroom house. When I got there, it was like heaven to me. They bought me a new bed and mattress. It just felt nice to have something new. Although my bedroom was very small, I was just happy to have it. A few weeks later, my housemate that had a bigger room said, I'm getting my housing department soon so you can have my room. Then I moved into the bigger room with a balcony. We paid $90 each fortnight for rent and that included our electricity and phone bills. We had to buy our own food and do our own cooking and keep the house clean. My welfare officer at work and my mental health social worker wrote letters of support for me to apply for public housing. When I took the letters to the Department of Housing, I was told that my file had been inactive. Once I got the letters, I went to the top of the list and I was offered a few housing options. I was offered a place near my family, which I took. That was in 1997 and I was around 36 years old. To have my own key and to let myself in and not to have to worry about anyone was really good. That's when my dad gave me a key to his house. That was the first time I had a key to his house so I could spend a couple of nights a week there with him. And they looked after my dog, Toby, because there were no fences at my house. When dad went away, I would stay at his house with Toby. One of the doctors had told my dad that I should never get out of hospital. Another told dad that I could get better and dad was proud of me living on my own. I am sad my mum never got to see me well. Mum died in 1985 when I was 23 years old. She never got to see me living in a place on my own and mum would have liked that. Ever since I moved into my own house, I've felt good. I've lived in that house for about 20 years. I worked at Richmond PRA and I enjoyed my job. My job was for people with a mental illness, so I didn't feel different. I didn't feel like I had a disability. I used to get up of a morning and I was doing things normal people do, going to work, shopping, doing the cleaning. I didn't feel like I had an illness then. Reading and numbers are hard for me and I'd missed a lot of school because I was sick. I did courses at TAFE to get better at readings and, and writing, and I am proud of the certificates and awards I got from TAFE. First, when I started at the workshop, we did headset and pack things and put stickers on things. And I worked in the kitchen, and then they even let me order the milk and the juice and yogurt and the cakes. And they used to get me to go to the supermarket I got awards for 10 years and 20 years service and the general manager's award for helping other people. The only thing that stopped me working was my foot and my leg. I kept getting cellulitis and I got an ulcer on my leg. They said I could come back after my surgery, but my mobility went backwards and I couldn't go back to work. If it wasn't for my mobility, I would still be working at my job and I would have worked until I was 70. There were steps in my house. Eventually, I couldn't get up and down the steps with my walker, so I was stuck in the house 24 hours a day. The shower was in the bathtub, so someone would have to swivel my legs into the bathtub and the OT wrote a report about the situation. Rather than modify the house, they transferred me to a disability place. I waited six weeks and then I got the place I'm in now. I've lived here for about five years. 
my life now. Today, I live in a one bedroom apartment on my own. Living on, in my own place is heaven for me. My current apartment has one bedroom, but it feels like a mansion to me. Now I have all the things that normal people have in a house. The abuse that I experienced was a long time ago, but it never leaves my mind. I still have a lot of trust issues because I feel I might be hurt again. After living in the boarding house, I still get scared by myself, but I am more scared of living with other people. I have been an NDIS participant since 2017. The NDIS pays for my supports now. I have support workers coming into my house every day to help with things including personal care. Because of the abuse that I have experienced, I do not like having male support staff. It has taken me a long time, but I now have a support team that I trust. If I didn't have NDIS, I would be in a nursing home. If I lived in a nursing home, I'd die of a broken heart. From time to time, some of the mental health team that support me now suggest that I move into supported accommodation. That upsets me and I don't want them to keep asking me about it. I do not want to go into supported accommodation or a nursing home because it reminds me of my time in the boarding house. I am happy to go to rehab to get better if I need to, but I always want to keep my home. I love my home and I want to stay here until I die. Charlotte, I'll just stop there. How are we going? Oh. Okay, keep going. Taking charge of my life. I have become more confident to take charge of my life and make sure that the decisions that are being made are in my best interest. With the help of my advocate, I have been able to start making sure that people listen to me before any decisions about my life are made. The mental health team and hospital team sometimes tell me when I turn 65, I will have to go on aged care funding. I do not want to leave the NDIS, but they think I had to. I have to educate the hospital workers and let them know I can stay on the NDIS if I want to. I have been working with my advocate to make sure that if something happens to me, anyone who has to make a decision about me knows what I want and has written evidence. My advocate has helped me get a will, an enduring power of attorney, and a guardianship order that states I do not want to go into shared living unless it is the last resort. Now, I don't have to worry about being put in a nursing home or a group home. Previously, I would go to the doctors and tell them I have pain, and they would tell me it's all in my head but now I have more confidence. I have been able to insist that the doctors review my medical issues and look for what is wrong. Because of this, I'm going to get new boots to help with my leg pain. I'm also getting people I trust to help me remember the important questions I have for my doctors and to remind me of important things that have happened so I can explain things and they listen better. Now my team know a lot more about what is going on in my body and that it's not all in my head. I like that I can give advice to other people who have been in bad situations and can help them feel connected and empowered. My hopes for the future. There shouldn't be boarding houses. While there are still boarding houses, they should be owned by the government, so there are more people involved than just the owners. There were no checks on the owners, so they could get away with things. 
I want there to be enough help for children with mental illness to be safe at home with their families. This is more help for the families, sorry, there is more help for the families now than there was back then. I still worry that I won't get enough support to keep living in my house or that people might make me leave. Going to a nursing home would feel like being back in an institution. There were no mental health centres for adults back then. In the boarding house, no one was under mental health care, so the GP could do whatever he wanted. There should be more people who you can tell who can tell you about the options and choices, like the welfare officers at the workshop did for me. Once I've gotten my story shared, I think that will end this all for me nicely. Now I want to be able to live. Sometimes it gets me very sad when I think about all those years like that. I've missed out on things like driving or having a wedding. It took me a long time to feel normal and I have a lot of memories about that and I want to let them go. Charlotte, thank you for your statement. I hope I've read that in the way you wanted. But there's a few things you'd like to talk to the commissioners and tell the commissioners about. Yes. Um, there, sh there shouldn't be any boarding houses. And if there is boarding houses, they shouldn't be privately owned. They should be run by the government so people can do more checks on them. Privately owned, they can do what they like and no one knows what they're doing. I think no boarding houses. And Charlotte, what would you like to happen in the future? You've said in your statement you don't want to live in a nursing home or supported accommodation. What would you like to see happen to you into the future? Well, I want to stay living where I am. I want to stay there till I die. I don't want anyone to move me because if I got moved, it will just be the same. And part of coming to share your story at the Royal Commission is that I think it's time for you to say, you don't want to have to remember all of these terrible things that have happened to you. No, I right? just want to live a life. And so sharing the story with the Royal Commission, we can take that story for you now. Well, thank you. And you um, are free to get on with your life. I know That's that good. you're thinking about doing a year 10 certificate, aren't you? Yeah. And so you want to do some more study and to live the life you want to have. Is that right? Yeah, the things I missed out on. Is part of that living like a teenager? Yes. And um, that's what you want to focus on is living the life that you've living missed out Living a life. Well, Charlotte, thank you so much for uh, working with us at the Royal Commission, for sharing your story, and thank you very much for letting me read your story today. Well, thank you. Commissioners. Do I have a question? Charlotte, would you mind if I ask the commissioners if they have any questions to ask you? Is that all right? I don't mind. You don't mind? You sure? Okay. I'll ask first Commissioner Galbley. Uh, uh, you can see her on the screen, and she is in Melbourne, so she's in this hearing 600 miles away, but she's yes. in the hearing. And I'll ask Commissioner Galbley if there's anything that she would like to ask you. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you so much um, for your evidence today, Charlotte. It was really um, very um, important. Um, I have no questions, but I just feel so pleased that, you know, you're now in, in a home that you love. Yeah, I yes. really feel so pleased, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Ryan is next to me in the hearing room and I'll ask Commissioner Ryan if he has any questions he would like okay. to Okay. Mr Chair, Charlotte, I don't have any questions, but I really do want to thank you for being so generous in sharing such a tough story with the Royal Commission. I really thank you for doing that. 
and uh, it's a very important story and I am just so glad I heard it but I don't have any questions it's been beautifully told it's very clear to understand and it's very powerful I'll remember it for a very long time so thank you thank you Mr. thank Chief. you thank you Charlotte I just have one question yes could you tell us what it is you particularly like about where you are now it's home it's home that's the best part about it. That's the best part. And I've got everything I need. And 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 I everything I got was brand new. And I own everything. No one's gonna steal from me anymore. No one takes my money. So you I feel mean, you feel safe. I feel safe now. That's wonderful. Look. Just as Commissioner Galbally said and Commissioner Ryan, I too want to thank you very much for making your statement, which is very detailed and which we will all remember and for coming to the Commission today to give evidence. We know it's not an easy thing to do and we're extremely grateful to you for coming and telling us about your experiences. So thank you very much and we all wish you the very best to do all the things that you've told us that you want to do. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you. So, Commissioners, if we could adjourn now for lunch and come back at 1.30. 1.30. All right, we'll come back at 1.30. We'll adjourn now and return at 1.30. Thank you. Thank you again, Charlotte. The Royal Commission is adjourned. The Royal Commission is resumed. I'm here too. Oh, there you are. <laughs> yes, Ms. Eastman. Thank you, Commissioners. Uh, so you'll see I'm sitting with Dawn, who's our next witness, and Dawn has already taken her oath. And Commissioners, a few weeks ago, or maybe about six weeks ago, Dawn came into the Royal Commission to meet with us and to share her story with us. We did a recording of the conversation between Dawn and myself and we thought we might start by playing part of the recording and then Dawn's written a few notes and so there's a few things Dawn would like to talk to you about today and I'll ask her some questions after the recording. Dawn, thank you very much, ah. both for doing the uh, pre-record with Ms Eastman and thank you for coming to the Royal Commission today. Uh, as Ms Eastman has said, we'll play some of the pre-record and then Ms Eastman will ask you some questions. Mm -hmm. I'd just like to explain where the commissioners are. If you look at the screen over there, that is Commissioner Galbally, who is in yeah. Melbourne, so she's joining the hearing remotely. And Commissioner Ryan is on my left and uh, I'm the chair of the Royal Commission. So thank you again for coming. And uh, what I'll do now is uh, ask uh, Ms Eastman to organise the pre-record of oh, your evidence. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Yes. All right, so I think we're ready to start. There in November. Uh, I'm starting. Pardon? <laughs> oh, that one. Oh, oh that would we'll do oh, that one. Me. Uh, <laughs> that, that was a strap who... That was that place was Stratford. Stratford. The new mm -hmm. oh, and what sort of place was it? Was it like a hostel or a boarding house? Oh, oh no, no. Like yes. Self contained. So you had your own for, unit? Yeah, no. for every 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 tenant there. Yeah. yeah, we had that. Yeah, it, so I was there for some time. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, there was a problem there. 
which are connected called understand. Um, somebody was giving out very bad information about me. I didn't know about it. Mm. And they, they were trying to say I had a mental problem. And the big boss he sent me to the mental place in uh, in the uh, in a, a there's a, a, a hostel uh, hostel hospital mm -hmm. there yeah and I I didn't know what was going on and and that's where all my problems started because I had no idea that anyone could make up laws because mm. all I ever did was keep to myself, do my business, say hello, no stay. And uh, that wasn't a problem for me, that it was a problem for some of these other people mm. because they didn't know much about me. Mm. And, and so what did you, did, did the big boss tell you that some people thought you might have a mental problem? Yeah. Is that what he told you? Oh yes, mm. he's the one who's he's the one who started it. Mm. And he's the one that said, Oh, you you go to that the uh that the, oh it's the hospital, the mental one. Yeah. Did you go to the hospital? Yeah, I did go and then I realised what was happening. What did it mean for did you were were you able to stay in your unit? Did you come back to your unit after being in the hospital? What happened? Um, well, it's time went by. There were there were changes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I did go to Coogee Beach on mm -hmm. one occasion, and uh, I, I think it's all the same kind of mentality. Uh, housing managers always on your back. A lot of things went wrong. Mm. Yeah. Where do you go or who do you ask if things aren't right? I did try uh, uh, or, or they'll try and help you. Mm -hmm. But uh, what I've found over the years is that if you give a certain type of problem and they don't really know how to handle it. They just sort of eventually sort of push you away a bit. Yeah. And they never really, you? really help you. How does that make you feel? That, that as you say, being pushed away a bit. How does that feel? Uh, I felt very annoyed because to have somebody say, oh, yes, we will help you. And then after 12 months or whatever it is, Oh, no, sorry, can't help you. And have people have people helped you find places to live? Oh, they have in numbers, yeah. But what happened with one particular occasion was um, there was a I don't know, lawyer or whatever. She would come and I told her what was going on. Mm. And she would come to me and say, Oh, well, I've, I've got this, this uh, paper here, right? Mm. It's the third, it's the first, she called it the first round. Mm. And then she'd come back and tell me, do the second round. Her lot, what she was, and then it will come to the third round, and she very briefly say, too many people involved. So all these people, uh, with the party, whether uh, how can I put it, different departments saying, oh, oh, there's that woman in there, there's that woman in there, and. I was aware of it because the lady who 
went to the third order. I think you might know the name. Yes. She, um, uh, well, she actually left eventually. Mm. But she was good but to tell me that there were so many people and you couldn't handle all those people who just merge on you. Oh, there's that woman again. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I know what I mean. So have you ever had sort of one person yeah. that you could always go to and go, that is the one person who I always know will help me? Have you had somebody like that in your life? Um, well, the lady did try to help me, but I wasn't quite sure well, why she left. Mm. I'm not quite sure. But you think she might have been a lawyer? Right. She might be a lawyer. Was that the lawyer? Oh, yeah, person? she was. Yeah. yeah, she went up to the, the third order. Mm. Yeah. And um, she must have done a lot of research. Mm. Yeah. I've forgotten her name, but I, I know she went up to mm. that order. When you talk about all the different departments around you, um, did any of those departments help you find? special housing to have a place to live? No, I don't think so, no. Dawn, have you, you had to have a bit of time rough sleeping, is that right? Have you had to do rough sleeping in the streets at all? I've done that, yeah. Okay. Can you done tell me about purpose. that? Yeah. Done it on purpose, okay. <laughs> There's a story here, Dawn. <laughs> tell us about it. <laughs> What's it like I doing the rough sleeping? I did it on purpose because um, there was that very nasty lady. She 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 had a uh, the um, that was my last accommodation. Mm the house on the hill okay yeah and um and the other people you know they'd say nasty things especially those fellas they ignored it and yeah but what, what happened i said to myself i'm not going to look for accommodation straight away <clears throat> i'm going to go go sleep out, okay, and they won't be able to track me down, because I knew what was wrong. Mm. That's why I did it. Mm. And I didn't intend to collect a lot of money. Mm. And, uh, I wasn't aware of that, but I did manage to save money mm. and do a lot of things. But it, it was just one of those things that they people do. Mm. Yeah. How did you, how did you feel? How did you feel when you were doing the rough sleeping and sleeping out? Um, what was that like? It's it's a learning process. Mm. It's you to be careful not to be seen especially when you're looking for somewhere to stay, things like that. You learn to be quiet and so they can't hear you. And, uh, but I did that <coughs> because I didn't know what I doing. I didn't trust it. And the last time I saw them, they were most insulted. Mm. Oh, yes, they came to my door, the four of them, and uh, they'd say, oh, we short start. And then they do the round. They go to these three, I think there's four of them, four staff. Oh, we short start. No, they put the short start. Next, sure start, sure start. And then they go on to another. And that's all they did. 
and they cut me short <coughs> of one and a half hours mm -hmm. of what I could have done in my day. And I wasn't happy with that. Mm -hmm. What happened to all, all of your things? Did that, when you were, uh, when you left, were you able to take all of your things with you or what happened well, to them? Well, I couldn't because they'd changed the lock. So you couldn't get into your own unit? No. So what happened to all of your things? I suppose they threw them out. Yeah. So when you left, spent that time lying low, keeping quiet oh, on your oh. street. What did you did you have somewhere to keep all I your things what, then? I know what you did mm. there. I told you about I came home and that's when they said you're leaving in September. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's where that gap is. Okay, so that's that connection. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. But they were very nasty too. Anyhow, I didn't say a word. I let them do their rounds and uh, haven't seen them since, thank God. Mm. Yeah. But oh they can be very, very nasty. When yeah. when you had that time uh, sleeping rough or on the streets, you didn't stay there forever. So no, you got you I went to around. find somewhere else to live. So what happened to to get off the streets and into a new place to live? Um, oh, that's when. How did that happen? Oh, that would be when I went to Meritville. Okay. Hey, wait a minute, hold oh, it. So I think. Oh, did you know, like you've, you've been to Ashfield, Dulwich Hill, and Meritville. So you've had those uh, three Meritville. places. Yeah. Yeah, Meritville. Yeah. That's okay. right. Yeah. So how did you get to the? How did you get your place in Meritville? How did you get in there? Did someone oh. help you get that accommodation? Oh yes, yeah. somebody said, "Oh yes, there's a there's a, a vacancy," mm -hmm. and uh, I didn't know what to expect. And uh, I thought, "Well, I've been on the street for a while, I'm tired of that." Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I decided, "Yeah, I'll." Uh, to go to that, that house, yeah, where you, I am. Do you have to pay any rent or any money to, to stay at the house? Oh, yes. It's um, $460 a fortnight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how do you pay that? Oh, well, I go into the real estate and do it. They take the cash. Okay. And how do you get the cash? Are you, do you, are you on a pension? Are you working? How do you do it? Uh, on the pension, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So your pension pays for your rent or, or yeah. the cost of staying at the house? So what I do... What I, do you do? Yeah, go to the bank once a fortnight, uh, draw out a certain amount of money for rental, See, that covers water, electricity, and that, yeah. And, the yeah. Ha and at the Marrickville house, do you share that house with other people? Or is it just you? Oh, we do share the house, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How's that? What's it like sharing house? Well, for some reason, the men won't talk to me. Mm. And... Uh, not too sure about those fellas. They are on the same age as you? Uh, well, I could be, I'd say a bit older than mm. Yeah, but not that much older. Do you all share a kitchen together? How does oh. the house work? Oh, yes, they mm. share, yeah. Mm. And yeah. how are you on your cooking and things oh. like that? Do you like doing any cooking? <laughs> well, it was okay. In the beginning, mm -hmm. and for some reason, they took all the cutlery away, and they took the plates away, and the saucepans away, and 
Did say they, anything to yeah. us. They just took them all away. Right. So what do you do now if you can't cook in your own house? No, what do you do? Just do it outside. Where do you go? Oh, different places. Yeah. 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 Um, go and join the street people. Mm. Uh, the good people. There are bad ones too. Uh, the good people do. Mm. Yeah. At the marketplace. Mm. Yeah. But uh, oh no, but I couldn't believe. It. That she just take the cutlery mm. away, and I, I wasn't about to confront her. Mm. And uh, I mean, what, what can you say? What can you say? Okay. Dawn, what during during COVID did you have to have the lockdowns? Were you locked down in COVID? What happened to you in COVID? Oh, I was. Yes, that's right. Uh, that was when the two gentlemen were standing there apart. Like I said, I thought these two guys were what are they standing there? Where were you when Yeah. Where were you? When I think this you was visiting when, somewhere or well the other lady she was going to give me the mobile so they could keep me in touch. Yeah. And those two men were standing there. Mm -hmm. And next thing they put me in the van. What? In a van? Yeah. The ambulance. Right. And what happened? Oh, I nearly froze. I was all oh, no. It's the worst thing I've ever had. Mm. Oh, terrible. Did you know where you were going? I had not a clue. But you're in an ambulance. I knew it was that. The ambulance was waiting there. Mm. And I think. What's the ambulance doing there? It's been there for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. That's there to pick up people like me. Where did you go? They didn't tell me. They didn't say a word. But you must have gone somewhere in the ambulance. Where did I you end up? I don't know. Mm -hmm. All I know, I'm in the van and then I'm escorted up to the where I'm going to stay. Mm -hmm the room and I was there for 14 days and uh, it, I don't know was it a hotel or it was a house? Like, like a hotel and did anyone tell you how long you were going to be with it's 14 days tell you nothing and how did you get out of there oh well they escorted me out um on the, on the appropriate day mm. because well i didn't have any good, uh, health problems mm. so uh but a taxi took me home that was about seven o'clock in the evening mm. yeah so uh, I, j I just can't i don't know how to put it but i know that my eyes are a lot worse now mm. because of those bright lights. Mm. Yeah, my hearing. And uh, it's very. Cut, cut out there, Dorman. I think you said that was very <laughs> definite. So when you went to stay in the hotel for the COVID, that really affected your eyesight and your hearing. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, Dawn, thank you for having that conversation with me a few weeks ago. Yes. There's a few other things you'd like to tell the Royal Commissioners today. So you've written some notes this morning. Uh, and yeah. can I ask you some yeah. questions about that? Um, what would you like to talk about? Yes, well, I was looking through them myself and I thought the best way to do it, to start from the very beginning... Just so I might ask you a few questions. So you came, you used to live in Adelaide. Pardon? You used to live in Adelaide in South Australia. Yeah. And you came to Sydney in about 1962. Yeah, yeah I have a reason for this. Yeah, okay. So what do you want to tell the commissioners about when you first yeah. came to live in Sydney? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll cross it off as I go, okay. go along. Yeah. <laughs> I That's know. fine. 
Let's start on page one. Yeah. All right, there we go. No, 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 I'm starting from the beginning. Are oh, you going to start from the I'm beginning? I'm telling okay. you why. All right, let's do it. I have to take my glasses off, sorry. Um, starting from oh, even before I, I was in housing, I was homeless. I did have a, a accommodation at different times. I came across an acquaintance and he was at Springwood and he said, you can stay in the place and look after it. And he would come and go on his push bike. So that was some time ago. Uh, uh, but what I... I don't quite know what he might have done. I've just forgotten there. That's okay. It was a while ago. Oh, oh that's right. I went back to the, the place uh, near um, in the city there where, mm -hmm. where they held him there. And um, oh, they did help me a bit then. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, I've just forgot it. That's Some okay. Details. Well, what, Dawn, can I ask you, because you've yeah. never had a place which is just your own home where you've lived alone and just been by yourself, have you? Yeah. Oh, but this, on this occasion, mm -hmm. uh, the person uh, had a home at Springwood. And you used to and look I after that And I was there for about 12 months. Okay. Yeah. And so. you've lived in lots of different places, haven't you? One time you were a cook at a boys' boarding school, weren't you? Did you do the cooking at a boys' school? Remember doing that? No, okay. You don't remember doing that? Abortion? No, a boys' school. So a school where all the boys went. No, no, uh, I'm not you sure. can't remember that? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Can I ask you, where, you're still living at Marrickville now, is that right? So you're still at Marrickville? Yeah. No, I, I have a reason for... You were to go yeah, back to this one? I have a okay. reason to this because at that stage I hadn't been of housing. Yeah. Right. But then when I came back to Sydney, there was an acquaintance of mine and he would go up to the mountains to Springwood and he'd stay there one or two nights, then he'd go back to Sydney again. And he said, well, you can stay at my place. And I was there for about 12 months. Mm -hmm. So I eventually left there. And uh, that was a, it was a help. Uh, after that. Where did you go after oh, that? I hadn't even been in then and eventually I did get and oh oh I know uh, when I was there wasn't known as that it, it, it was the uh, place uh, that was <coughs> that was and you've lived people. there. And that, that was at a time and, where people thought you might have some mental health issues. Yes. Yeah. And then there was another another uh, branch <laughs> well, fell into that. And so <laughs> lot, lot swelling out a bit like that. But I was at Stratfield mm -hmm. and I was there when there was all the changeovers and whatever mm -hmm. they did. And Dawn, that's what we were talking about when we started playing the video. We started by talking about yeah, what happened yeah. in Strathfield. Now, but, but what I, I do want to put to your attention mm -hmm. was when I was, I had a problem with the tenants and uh, so, uh, some of them made up stories about me because they... Uh, they said I was mental, something like that. I have no idea what they had to say. And 
there was about five of them and they wrote their separate letters and they sent it to the mental hospital. And from there on, I was always dubbed, oh, she's mental. And, uh, and that didn't make you feel so good, did it? Yeah. You didn't like that? Yeah, I know. But you see, that is what was happening. And um, I, I couldn't do much about that because uh, they couldn't prove anything. I haven't been in the asylum. I haven't go around screeching to people. Uh, so they, they couldn't find a reason why they should try and get me in, but they still tried. Mm. They are very determined. Okay. So, Dawn, um, the commissioners also have some questions that they want to ask you. So can I ask you one more question? Yes. And that is, where are you living now? Are you still at Marrickville? Sorry, where? You're still at Marrickville? I'm still at Marrickville, okay. yeah, because the real estate agent said I could stay. All right. And that's you're living with four other people, four other men? Uh, well, oh, how can you put it? Oh, I shouldn't say it, but the, the homosexuals don't like, as a rule, don't like women. Okay, so and, these are ones who and, live with you and they don't talk to you very much. Yeah. I oh, know, but um, unfortunately, they um, don't do the right thing. Okay, well, we won't and talk about what they do or they don't. I know. But you still live, they still live in the same house as you, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Well, most of the men uh, don't really know them well because they lock themselves in their, in their bedrooms. Mm. But it's true. So, Dawn, I think when we spoke before, I asked you about where would you like to keep living? So you're about what, can I say your age, about 78 years old well, now? You're about 70. Where would I like to go? Where would you like to go? Oh. So I think you've said you don't want to go into aged care, do you? Oh, my true feeling is to go up to the mountains. Mm. And you want to live somewhere where there's lots of uh, yeah. trees and gardens and... Yeah. That's what you'd like to do, is that right? Yeah, I'll, I'll go up there once a week and uh, uh, I'll have to go the weekend, uh, the, uh, you know, week, weekday, I mean, yeah, mm. and see what's around. See what's around. Well, Dawn, thank you very much for coming to the Royal Commission and telling us your story and talking to us when you came to visit us at the Royal Commission office. And I'll just check if the commissioners have got any questions they want to ask you because they might want to ask you a couple of questions as well. So you'll see them talk in a minute. Now, Dawn's hearing is not so good, commissioners, so if I can assist, let me know. Very good. Um, I'll ask Commissioner Galbally, whom you can see on the screen, whether she has any questions cool, she would like to ask. I'd like to thank Dawn very much. Um, Thank you so much for coming and uh, telling us about the, 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 your, your experience with homelessness and sleeping rough. I found it very valuable. Thank you very much. No questions. No questions um, on that one. Good. And I'll ask Commissioner Ryan, who's sitting next to me, oh, well, we whether he has any questions. Dawn. First of all, thank you for coming to the Royal Commission. I really appreciate yeah. hearing from you. Can you tell me, do you have anybody helping you with uh, cooking your dinner or going shopping? Do you have somebody to help you cook dinner or go shopping? Uh, no, I don't need help in that way. No. So you don't have any help no. to do uh, that? No, I'm, I'm quite independent that way. Yes. Um, if you've got any, how, how do you go to the doctor? You decide you want to go to the doctor, do you just take yourself? Do you go to the, do you go to the doctor? And if you have to go to the doctor, do you just go yourself? Uh, no, I didn't actually have any reason to go to the doctor, no. Right. I didn't have any falls, nothing like that. When you left the house you were living in in Marrickville, am I right in understanding that you left it because you felt that you would be in trouble with someone 
so you were getting away from them. Is that, did I understand you properly? So, you know, when you decided to go and get away from nasty people and that's when you decided to sleep yeah. out or sleep rough, were you, what, what, is it the question, Commissioner, yeah, why you felt you had to leave to go yeah. out of your house? Oh, yes. Uh, I, I, I don't actually um, stay home and have my food there. I am. Um, uh, um, like a lot of other young people or older people uh, who, who, who just want to uh, get some food somewhere and then, and that's the way they do it. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you, Dawn. You've helped me understand some very important things and I'm very grateful for your generosity in coming to the Royal Commission yes, and telling you. us about your life. I thank you very much. He said, thank you very much. Uh, okay. Chair? Yeah. What? Dawn, um, you've said that you were sleeping rough. Here I am over here. You said you were sleeping rough for some time. You were sleeping rough for some time. When you were doing that, where would you sleep? What would, what would happen like, just on a day-to-day -day basis? Where, where would you go to try and be safe? So when you when you were sleeping rough and you were on the streets, you know, you said when you're sleeping rough, you kept very quiet and no one could see you. Where did you actually go? What type of places did you spend the night when you were in the streets? Where would you go? Uh, what do you mean? Uh, I didn't quite catch it. So when you were where sleeping you rough, where did you go? When? Where did you sleep at night time? Where did you go? When you're on the street? <laughs> or are they secret know. spots and you're not going to tell us? Uh, sometimes I do different things and uh, I don't always look back and think about yeah. what they do. Right, that's that's, that's okay. fine. That's okay. Dawn, thank you very much for speaking to Ms Eastman and we saw the, the tape on the screen. And thank you very much for coming yeah. today to tell us about your own experiences. We're very grateful to you for helping the Royal Commission and you have been a big help to us. Thank you very much. So he said thank you very much. So, Commissioner, thank you. thank you very much. Um, a big thank you to Dawn for coming to speak to us today. We're going to have a very short break and then you'll hear from Jack. So, probably about five minutes, if that's well, okay. Well, it's just after Commissioner. five past two, so we'll resume at uh, 2.15. Okay, thank you. The Royal Commission is adjourned. All right, thank you. The Royal Commission is resumed. Mr Fogart, yes. Thank you, Chair. The next witness is Jack. Chair, Jack did a pre-recording uh, with me in July of this year, and that will be played in a moment. I understand Jack has already been administered the oath, so uh, if the recording could be played after just, you... Just before, yes, just before Jack. we do that, Jack, thank you. Thank you for coming to the Royal Commission today. Thank you also for the pre-recording that you did with uh, Mr Fogarty. I'll just explain where the commissioners are. You can see on the screen in front of you, Commissioner Galbally. She is Hello. Joining, she, is, she is joining the hearing from Melbourne and Commissioner Ryan is with me in the hearing room. His wave is a little less expressive than the Commissioner <laughs> Shelburne, oh, but he still did try to wave. And uh, I'm the chair of the commission, and we actually met uh, outside. Yes, and thank you for that, sir. So thank you very much for coming to the commission and for telling us your story. And I'll ask Mr Fogarty now to uh, play the uh, pre-recorded material. 
Yes, thank you. Good Sarah afternoon, Larson. Jack. Thanks, Thanks for fun. coming. Good day. Can you tell me how old you are presently? In my seventies. In your seventies, and um, you. The next topic I want to talk about is your current li living arrangements, where you live. So the simple one word answer to that is I live in Australia, mm -hmm. and being too old for paid work, I go and volunteer on country properties. Mm -hmm. So all over Australia. When you're not volunteering uh, in the bush, as I call it, what, where do you, where do you live? Do you have a place for you, of your own, or do you move around? So, um, sleeping in the trains, um, various spots around the city, and look, there's some some lovely people. One night, you know. Was bedding down and so far from here, and we got some guys. And one of the guys said, um, You need a blanket, and gave me his blanket. Mm, guess for con reference, where we're in the middle of Sydney, right? The CBD. So. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and do you, do you consider yourself, I'll use a label here, and I might use a few today, homeless or a homeless person? Um, yes, uh, I, I, um, no, I come to this. Uh, use a lot of family services, like I just had lunch, uh, and um, and and again, you know, they're they they they're really kind people. This morning, I was walking on Park Street, round about a bit before eight o'clock this morning, and um, oh, you can't see the picture, of course, but I suppose I do look a bit decrepit. That was before I had a shower too, um, and. Uh, and I, I was collecting cans, just still there, having cash them in. And, uh, and uh, got very quiet and politely just sit and had it. burst into tears. And it's not unusual for people to give me money, but $50 mm. is really, and, and I guess I don't. <laughs> Sorry, what this is, and don't stop it because no. that's right. Um, and I, I don't deserve it to be honest. I mean, just because I'm collecting cans, mm. it's a time. Um, but you, you know, and, and that was one thing this morning. Just now, I went to a homeless service, what Matthew Talbot, yeah, Friday. Anyone out there who wants lunch, guys, it's the only guys, sorry, girls. Once lunch on a Friday, Matthew Talbot, you can guarantee Catholic fish and chips lunchtime. On Friday. <laughs> so I have my lunch. And they also have a, uh, a uh, I suppose you call it a sick bay nurses. Yeah. And, uh, so you use that. Yeah. yeah. Can I ask you, how long have you, uh, well, what about public housing or boarding houses have you? And 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 yes, so so if I was in public housing, I would feel guilty, and people tell me I shouldn't, um, because I would be taking up a place in public housing uh, when other people need it. And yeah. and and yeah, you're obviously in a public place a lot of the time, but interaction with 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 the police, with sleeping on a train, for example, putting your I don't know, I'm not going to impugn you here, but you know, putting your feet on the seats or do you ever get, what's, how's your interaction with police over the years in your, in your public living? Okay, occasionally, especially if we, if we sleep on the train and then are coming back early in the morning. Mm. Um, yeah, and, and, and another passenger might, might say something, yeah. but... Uh, I mean, um, yeah, the, 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 well, what, one night I was on the Blue Mountains train and I was, you know, sitting bored a bit and there was a fellow behind me, the TV inspectors came through mm. and, um, and, and, uh, passed the fellow bridge to get me shaked by him. And, and, you know, he was obviously a bit sleepy, the TV inspector said, well, you obviously, you know, 
stepping on the train or trying to wake you up again. Mm. I, um, yeah, uh, usually, depending which 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 trains, but the, 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 there are a couple of trains that are really good. You know, they go to the end of the line and we're allowed to stay in the train. Yeah, right. Um, at most of the stations, they want us out. Mm -hmm. um, even if the train just waiting there to go back. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, people sleep in Central Station. Um, the police at Central have, have um, warned me, you know, because a, 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 a lot of homeless people sleep um, down on Eddie Avenue underneath Central Station. So to me, it's, it's not good to you look at it's not good to go down there. Where, 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 I'm, I, where I am at the moment, um, you know, with, with no electricity and, and, uh, and uh, was rightly described to me the other day as, as, as being a squat. Um, I, I, I feel safe and secure and, and, and the various services asked me, and you know, I'm warm, I'm comfortable, and yeah. tonight I've got fifty dollars. <laughs> yeah, and that 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 property is outside of Sydney. I don't necessarily need to talk about where it is. Yeah, yeah. and and how long have you have you lived in lived in there? A while? Or? So, trying to be truthful, I don't know. Yeah, but I'm guessing ten years, yeah. perhaps more. Yeah, where do you keep your possessions? Do you travel with your key possessions and leave some there? Or? There are a couple of services in the city, yeah. well, particularly in the city. And although there are any number of, of homeless people about, very rarely is there a problem. Yeah. Um, I, I, in fact, I, I was there earlier in the day <coughs> and left um, and my bag. Um, I bags over there. Which has some new workshop clothes today because I'm mm. in the city. Um, and uh, I, I, I felt quite comfortable leaving the bag there mm. with a whole lot of other people's bags. Um, and and um, you know, I checked it thoroughly, but it certainly seems very full like it was when I left it. And I would be surprised if it's anything else. One issue uh, I'll use a label homeless people have, as I understand, is is problems with like, ID if they need to go to a bank or they need to engage. Has that ever been a problem for you? <laughs> yes. Uh, and how do you go around it? How to get around it? Yeah, that's right. What, one, one. Uh, oh, where's the right side of one? Um, one of the homeless services thought I needed a mobile phone. It's very kind of them, and quite um, fine. And then, and then they hooked it up to to um, the telecommunications um, using their address. Oh. Um, the, the, the girl who hooked up for me, uh, you know, said to the operator from the other end of the phone, use her work address. So, yeah, and and. Um, I have a post office box. Another topic I, I meant to ask you about is what about camaraderie? You talk about, I know you've, you've got a mate, I think, who, who goes out volunteering with you. Have you found camaraderie among people you've hung out with? <laughs> another, another mate. <laughs> I have a couple of stories. Um, but are these, are these mates you've met? In your yeah, yeah so volunteering. You know, yeah. Yeah. Are they, can I, I'm going to use another label, but are they homeless? And it's for homeless people as well. In a way, yeah, yeah, yeah yes. Um, I mean, one, one of the fellows, uh, he has um, four children, two girls and, and two boy twins, um, and and uh, went to school with Prince Charles. So I don't know if it's him, um, but um, lives in a caravan. Mm. Um, and, uh, and, and and the other fellow, uh, you know, is, 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 um, he's a, a 
a fellow in his professional organization. Uh, but um, yeah, it's, it's comfortable, he has a one bedroom flat. Mm. I think he tells me that I, I think at one stage he told me I'm the only other person that's ever slept there, not obviously with me, yeah. but in his flat, in the yeah. of his lounge, yeah. um, which he made him so bed, comfortable bed. Yeah, so, so, um, but um, this will sound crazy. Um, I, if, if I was ever uh, brave enough to, to, to take an I mean, I was, well, it's about 30, I was about 35 when I married, so I, 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 I'm, I'm disappointed that I, I, uh, That the marriage failed uh, because my parents were also divorced, and I hope that we can impose that on my parents and children. Um, and, and, and one of the, the reasons I've disguised, uh, disguised today is because I'm, I'm ashamed of my situation. Yeah. Um, doesn't fit in with the kinds I want. And I would be embarrassed if, if um, the, the, particularly my family, um, and the thousands of people who through yeah. work. Uh, I get a and, and, Yeah, and, and, and I burst into tears. And, and I'm sure if they knew, they, they would uh, welcome me, but I... Uh, you can feel that shame. Yeah, 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 that's, that's a good word. Some sort of final topic. This one, are there changes for homeless people you think would be helpful, even if it's not your own experience, it might be things observed, whether it be more funding, different services, training, I don't know, it's a, it's a broad yeah, topic. I, yeah, so, uh, it's, so identifying as a slow learner, um, shy, you know, I, I tend not to answer, but I, I'd be a gentleman, mm. or to be a gentleman, which means back. It just doesn't fit into the legal system. So right. may, maybe if there, if there was, and I don't know whether you might call him a broker, um, who, who, who um, a new and naive um, person in need of legal assistance could go to. So you, so you think that translates to other homeless persons and the needs they may, they may have? As well, in oh, terms of legal hand, needs and yeah, legal access. Per person's legal service. Can I ask you one last question? It's my last question. You might have already answered it in, in substance, but if I, if you had a magic wand and you could change your living circumstances, would you change them? Mm -hmm. And if you would, uh, how would you how would you change? Them? Can I give you two answers? Yes, yeah. but then I've been explaining yes and no. <laughs> um, I, I, I suppose one advantage about moving from one, moving around the city, mm. you know, from one side of the city to the other, what do they say? It changes as well as a holiday. I think you think you'll keep your future. Yeah, no. well, uh, I, I, I hope so. That would be the end of that. Would be <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, Jack, you, thank you for sharing that story, and I can see um, it's raised some emotions for you. Please, if you need a break or what have you in the next couple of moments when I ask you a question or two, and I know there's something important you want to say and I'll, I'll ask you about that. Please let me know. Um, the one question I had from what we talked about in July was around the homeless services you use. You talked about Matthew Talbot. Um, how have those services assisted you? How have they helped make a difference to you? Hmm. I guess 
one one word answer, which has two 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 words, um, a, a lot, um, and um, yeah, I, I mean the the as as you've said, the, the message that I want to say um, is thank you to, um, to to so many people, in, including our homeless services. I mean, um, I. Um, had a shower and breakfast this morning, no questions, yeah. you know, um, very accepting, very tolerant. I'm reluctant to name the home of the services because I'll probably forget one, but... Um, you access them in Sydney and anywhere else you access them, Jack, outside of Sydney as well? From time yes. To time? Uh, I'm a little bit reluctant to talk about this yeah. and and because I've actually emailed and said thank you to this group. Um and um, I've also said that uh, I, I'm a bit uh, concerned about advertising exactly who they it would be great advertising for them if I tell you who they are. But well, I'm don't, don't say anything. No, no, I'm concerned they'll get overwhelmed with, but I need to say thank you. Oh. And if I burst it, here, it's okay. I, 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 I took a computer and asked, could they fix it? And what they did is give me a $2,000 new computer. Now, I mean, as I said, with $50. I mean, here I am, silly old homeless bloke, you know, divorced family, shattered family. How, how can I deserve that? But, yeah, so the, the message is, it, they, I did have two messages, but this, this is one of them anyway. The message is thank you. They, 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 there's just so much help and assistance. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't need to come back tomorrow, but uh, I'm, I'm, I might well, and, and I, I could walk around the city and probably choose what sort of meal I want tonight. Yeah. Um, and... Um, yeah, the, uh, and then in the morning there were well two places for, uh, you know, to, to the to reason to have a shower, um, and um, yeah, the the, the 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 services are there. The, the, there's there's plenty of homeless services. And, and um, I think you wanted to thank, and you spoke about it when we did our pre-recording, the, the individuals who see you in the streets and come up and overwhelm you with generosity. Yeah, and and and. Oh, yeah. Show and tell story, and even today the staff here. Have you lean forward in a bit, Jack. Oh, oh, sorry. Even today the staff have donated me bottles. You know, um, and and um, I, I, I'm, oops, um, this, this this is good environmentally, and the ten cents help as well. Yeah, feel I can be you know do, do, do it, doing some good. Now, just half a minute while I. I are there any other thank yous you wanted to say? Oh, look, lo lo lots, oh lots and lots. Oh, uh, just particularly one that was mentioned on the recording there, um, I, I was sitting down and there were three or four other blokes and, and as mentioned on the recording, one of the blokes said, oh, you need a blanket, gave me a blanket. Now, the blanket he gave me was not the blanket he was using. It was a brand new blanket, still in its plastic wrapping. And because it was summer, so I used it as a pillow, but then gave it back to him in the morning. There's just so much kindness. Yeah. And, and um, especially around the city, um, this, this company that, that, you know, gave me a computer actually in Newcastle. So now people are not me on Newcastle to get a free computer. Um, yeah, I mean, um, just thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for having me today. Um, I mean, nearly all the churches, um, the Catholic Church, obviously, the Salvos, well known. The Orthodox Church from Bexley comes in on Saturday morning and gives a, 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 a great lunch, you know. Um, the famous Bill Cruz from Ashfield comes in every night of the year, except one night, except New Year's Eve. The these, these are all services you. These are all services. And, and yeah, and, and I mean, washing. Uh, Orange Sky, a couple of young people yep. um, just set up a washing system that and now have lots and lots of vans, you know, around the city. Um, 
around the Central Coast, around Newcastle. So these services have all made a, a massive difference to your life and wellbeing? Yeah, yeah. And, and um, yeah, and, and I, I mean, it, 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 yeah, we can almost pick and choose, you know, which, which ones we want. Um, and, uh, yeah, the, look, I, said, I, I need to lose weight. Yeah. You know, so, so, oh, sorry. So, so, so uh, yes, I'm glad the screen's here. I'm waving. I'll start singing. And, and I mean, look, th 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 this is what life has dealt, whatever. Um, and, and um, yeah, try to live with it. Lots of famous people lived with it. Um, now, the other, th the, oh, now it's slipping my mind. The, the second thing that I was going to say was and it came, oh here we go here we go great great oh yes yes I know I think you asked um, how can the Royal Commission what can the Royal Commission yeah. do to assist yeah please. and um, and and uh, the legal system um, I, I don't know if you'll agree I I, I um, how do I say? Anyway, yeah, I would stand in front of hundreds of people and in my job and say I'm a quiet, shy little person and they would laugh. But I, I, I was being honest and I guess that's why I'm a bit hidden here. Um, but I see myself as quiet and shy and and um, and, and thus I have problems. And, and, you know, I'm not old and slow thinking and, and I mean... You obviously cut out of the recording my my school history, which was total failure at the end of school. Yet, you know, persistence, persistence, persistence. I managed to end up with a union degree, and and um, mm. yes, yeah, so 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 so. Um, so yeah. the change you're talking about, the support that we talked a little bit about for those who who might be in that proactive support from to access the legal system. Yeah, I mean. The, <laughs> yeah, all you, all, oops, all you people know the legal system much better than I do, but um, the, the, uh, we seem to have a very adversarial system and there is an alternate um, alternate dispute resolution, I think, and, and, um, and yeah, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to hear, I hope I can say it, I'm pleased to hear that I think that the, the Commission is, is, is looking at... Um, uh, uh, as a means of resolving things. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Ways of resolving things rather than days and days in the family court, which costs a fortune. I um, and and um, yeah, and as I say, I'm I'm no good at answering questions. You know, quickly thinking quickly. So, thanks, yeah. Jack. Jack, you've done pretty well. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> Chief that, Commissioner. Those are the questions I had, Chair, so I'll, I'll hand to you and the other Commissioners if they have any additional questions. Thanks. Jack, when Mr Fogarty asked you where you lived, <clears throat> you said in Australia. Y yes, sir. yes, sir. And you're an Australian citizen. Yes, sir. Yes. And you said you'd retired so that you've worked in the past. Yes. Yes. Why do you say that you don't think you deserve to have public housing? Mm. Yes, that, that that's true, and why? For example, and this is a little dated, but um, you realise when some time ago the deal was that we went to this particular property. I travel around Australia to various properties and and basically volunteer on country properties. We went to this particular property for a month. And and then this all dated. Then then the the COVID lockdown came on, so we actually stayed on that property for nine months. Now, if I was in public housing, um, one, I would be keeping someone else out of it, and I would feel guilty and bad about that. Um, and uh, a, a number of times that's happened. I mean, I I, um, I came to the city for a day. And I think I ended up being here. We went to a property for three months. Um, so I suppose the advantage of public housing is, is, is that, uh, as, as um, Dawn has said earlier, would be stable housing, somewhere to stay. Yes. But if I'm not going to be there, 
how do I, as it's not for me to ask the commissioners questions, but how do I avoid feeling guilty? Um, well, by arranging with the, the landlord, who might be the public housing authority, mm -hmm. maybe to have somebody come into the house temporarily who needs uh, emergency accommodation so mm -hmm. the accommodation well, isn't wasted. Yeah, that, yes, sir, that's, that's a good idea, except that, um, as I say, uh, I can think of a month yeah. And then the month, uh, hopefully we're not going to get more COVID lockdowns, but the month becomes yeah. nine months. Oh. Um, yeah, and, and, and by, by volunteering, I started volunteering back in 1960s, early 1961, I think, May, May 1961, and virtually been volunteering ever, all through school and ever since. And, and um, yeah, so I, I don't know if I so value you're, volunteering. You've done your bit. For Australia, well, that, that's that's kind of you. Well, <laughs> that's kind of you, sir. Um, and uh, yeah, um, yeah. I, I, I suppose another thing is that that if I was in public housing, would I feel? Do you know what the word is? Locked into it. Um, would I? Yeah, I mean, um, that's that's fine. Thank you. I think you've answered my question. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll ask Commissioner Ryan now whether he has any questions for you. Jack, first of all, thanks for coming to the Royal Commission. Um, can I ask you, when you need to go to the doctor, how do you organise that? Do you just go to any doctor? Have you got one you go to? Um, I don't know if it's unfortunately or if it's it's caring in a way. Once we get to 75, um, and one of the things I do, in, in, I drive fire trucks, you know, um, an ambulance was one of these properties had a lovely Mercedes ambulance. Cruise control was great to drive. Um, and um, so I actually have a truck licence. And... Um, and, and so to keep that and to keep any licence, once we get to 75, we need to have an annual medical check. So the, uh, the RTA, which is now called the RMS, I think, um, make sure that I go and see the doctor at least once a year. Um, do, do you go to the doctor if you feel sick? Um, yeah, well... Hopefully, I don't feel sick. But yes, I, I mean, I, I, I'm not averse to going to the doctor, and obviously, I have to go at least once a year. And um, and 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 uh, one example of, was living up in the Blue Mountains, and the doctor said, "Oh, you know, I, I think you know, I'd like to send you to see a specialist in Macquarie Street." And then he explained, "Just you probably know the Blue Mountains, the intercity trains terminate Central." So he said. You know, you just hop on the bus and go down to Macquarie Street. And I said, oh, central to Macquarie Street, I'll just walk. And he said, oh, not many of my patients that walk central to Macquarie Street. You don't need to go and see the doctor at Macquarie Street. So, um, yeah, try to be healthy. It, it, it's an, I, I mean, there are many advantages in the country. I mean, fencing and, you know, weeds get, can be over my head, um, you know, Keeps us healthy, hopefully fit. Um, yes, but but yeah, I and, and not not uh, no, and as I say, not averse to going to see the doctor and and the RMS make sure that I go at least once a year. And, and how do you do banking, for example? Do you do you have a card that you pay for things, or do you have a bank account? Yes, I suppose yes. Is, 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 is without being flippant. Um, uh, the, the, yeah, the, the um, yeah, um, and and uh, despite what Scott Morrison said, uh, the um, post office have a great banking service all over right. Australia, and and uh, three of the major banks, um, and I think many of the minor ones um, are accessible uh, through the post office. So banks are. Readily available, even Saturday morning in, in, in some instances. So if you lost your card, how would you get it again? 
Um, Does somebody help you with that, or how do you do it? Oh, I, mean, I don't mean to be flippant, but you haven't lost your car. Apply, well, 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 hopefully not. I'll make sure. Um, go and apply for a new one. Um, yeah, it, 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 you know, it, it, but that that would be a problem, and, and depending where I am. Um, but um, a, a lot a lot of the volunteering has been up and down the Murray River, so the towns, Mildura, go in and uh, last time I was there, the, well, the major banks were there and I think Bendigo Bank and, yeah, so... Um, and the banks are happy with your post office box then as an address? Um, I'm not sure Jack can answer a question about the degree of contentment of our major banks. <laughs> do your best. Yeah, well, well yeah, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, 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 well, yeah, you yeah, don't I, have an address, so I take it your post office box is the address. provides you with the address. Yeah, is that yeah, right? that's right. And, yes, um, and, um, yeah, uh, the, the bank statements go there so far, and, of course, with the internet now, internet banking, um, yeah, let's hope I don't use the, don't lose the card. Yeah. Well, thank you. You've explained some very important things to us, and I have learnt some things in listening to you. So I'm very grateful that you came to the Royal Commission. All right. D just in relation to address, um, an, a number of the um, service organisations um, are provide a postal service, so they're happy to, to um, um, care for us in that way. I'll ask now Commissioner Galbally if she has any questions. Um, thank you so much, Jack. Um, no, I have no questions. Thank you, though. Thank you, but Mel Mel Melbourne people are special because back up and down the, Haw the Hawkesbury, the wrong river, the Murray, of course, you're much closer. Uh, the Murray is much closer to Melbourne than Sydney, so people there um, tend to relate to Melbourne. And from the Murray, uh, the, been the odd day, a wet day, when we've actually driven from the Murray uh, to Melbourne and back in the day. I think so I agree Mel with and, you. And Melbourne has yes, and and, and Mel Melbourne has those lovely hundreds of trams. Yes, we're well, I'm very glad you said that, Jack. Because I was born and uh, raised in Melbourne, so uh, I'll t I'll take that as a compliment from you. Yes, and and actually, um, well, Melbourne was good to me. I suppose I uh, went to Melbourne to study. Did at, you? Yeah. Where about? At at, at um, RMIT. So not not at a university, but at in, RMIT in Swanson Street. In Swanson Street, yes, yeah. and and. Um, if you look very carefully in those days, you would have seen a company called John Sackville and Sons Limited just a bit further up in Swanson Street on the corner of Queensbury Street. Yes, yes, and 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 the library on Swanson yes, Street. Yes, the and, library and in Swanson Street. Yes, all true. Yes, and 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 of course. And did you have a team, football team? Uh, my my my, uh, my wife in those days. That's the first thing I asked her. Didn't ask me so much, but they asked her when she arrived, and, and so they gave her Collingwood. Um, oh, not well, sure if that I'm, was. I'm very sorry to hear that. <laughs> Carlton, maybe <laughs> the Blues, no. <laughs> and and this is a years ago, so there were no Swans. No, we couldn't have Sydney. Oh, swans. there were Swans. They were just called South Melbourne. But that, well, that's it. yes, yeah. yes, that's right. That, that oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, I better not uh, reminisce about South Melbourne. That was take us back quite a few decades. Jack, thank you very much for coming and thank you. And thank if you. I may say so, you had no difficulty answering our questions. And thank you very much for giving us the information you have, which we very much appreciate and for which we are most yeah. grateful. Thank you. you. You probably have the last word, but if, if I, without bursting your tears, can just say thank you. Thank you for listening to me and thank you to all those services and individuals that, that shake hands and just give me two dollars ten dollars once fifty dollars and 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 now last week a computer two thousand dollars worth of computer thank you jack it's a pleasure thank you thank you, chair. Thank you for thinking that mr fogarty are we going to take a little break i understand five minutes chair and then colin all right well it's, it's just before uh, uh five to three so we'll resume at 3 p.m thank you thanks the Royal Commission is adjourned. <laughs>
The Royal Commission is resumed. Mr. Fogarty. Thank you, Chair. The next witness is Colin, a resident of Lismore since he was a teenager, including this year during the uh, February floods. Colin has provided a statement dated 5 August 2022 for this public hearing. Uh, it's behind hearing bundle A1, tab 4. There's also some documents associated with Collins uh, applying for the NDIS and being an NDIS participant and some photos of his experiences during the flood. And those for reference can be found behind hearing bundle A1 tabs five to seven and A3 tabs six to 13. Yeah. Colin, thank you very much for coming to the Royal Commission. That's all right. Give evidence and thank you very much for preparing the statement which we have and which we have read. All right. So yep. thank you for that information, which is very helpful to the Royal Commission. Uh, I'll just explain where everybody is. You can see Commissioner Galbally on the screen in front oh, yes. of you or, or on the left. She's there wherever you look, in fact, there she is. And she is in Melbourne participating in the hearing remotely. Commissioner Ryan is on my left in the Parramatta hearing room and I'm yep. the chair of the Royal Commission. And of course, Mr. Fogarty, who's asking you, who will ask you some questions, is also in the same room. Yep. So we very much appreciate you coming to the Commission to help us and we look forward to hearing your evidence. Thank you. No worries. Chair, I understand uh, Colin will require an affirmation. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, yes. Chair. Uh, if you would be good, I understand you will take an affirmation. Yep. If you would be good enough to follow the instructions of my associate who is just there, and uh, he will explain to you what you need to do. Yep. I will read you the affirmation. At the end, please say yes or I do. Yep. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence which you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you very much, Colin. Now, Mr. Fogarty will, uh, I think, ask you some questions. Thank you, Chair. Colin, uh, you've lived in Lismore, in Lismore since you were a teenager. Yep. Um, and you have, uh, you moved there with three siblings growing up. Yes. Three yep. siblings of yours. Uh, and you also um, have run a business there. I did do for many years, yeah. And that was a radiator. Radiator shop. All right. And you have uh, family still there, is that right? I've got a sister. All right, and uh, sister, two nieces, and I've now got a daughter, and they all live in the Liz in Lismore Liz area. Yep. All right. Um, you finished your radiator business in is it twenty seventeen or so? Yeah, start? roughly twenty seventeen. Yep. After that, can you tell the Royal Commission what you what you did in the years after that? Uh, basically, I just went to Europe for a holiday, sort of liked it. Come back here, sort of thought it was all right, so I went back again for. A, couple of months and then I just kept when I got back to Lisbon I just I uh, got a job as dis disability worker support worker yep uh, local school as a greenskeeper and just driving the odd taxi here and there I see you um you use a wheelchair currently I do now yes uh, since and, the flood. and you have a diagnosis of muscular dystrophy correct? yes yep um and that that uh Muscular dystrophy has affected your siblings as well? Yes. Can you tell the tribunal if it's not too difficult to talk about how it's affected your siblings? Uh, my older brother and sister passed away. Take your time, Colin, and if if you need a break, let me know, or if you want no, to move right. on, let me tell me I'll move on. And my on. sister's had it now for probably 15 years. This is young, your youngest? My youngest sister. Yeah. But she's at that stage now, she sort of can't get out of bed. Can't go to the bathroom, can't make a cup of tea, so we've got a lot of support work. We just hoist her in and out of bed. And, and she she lives in Lismore? She's in, I've lived with her for the last few years. And that's where you were? That's uh, where I was living. Time, I was sort of time, time. to look after her a bit. All right. Um, in 2021, you um, started receiving the disability support pension? Yes. Um, you've worked all your life. Was that something that was difficult for you to come to terms with? Yes. I still sort of have them, I suppose. Yeah, and in your, the statement you've provided, you talk about being, in my words, in denial about muscular dystrophy for a while. I have been forever, yeah. yeah. Just and rather not know about it. All right. Um, and what precipitated you in recent years, I guess, my words here, coming to terms with that? Um, the way I walk. I've got a funny walk. Yeah. And I broke my foot. 
just broke a bone in the side of my foot. And I just thought it was because of the way I was walking, putting too much weight on it. Yeah. So I went to a doctor's and they said, go to a physio. I went to physio and had to go to a podiatrist, but it kept putting my back out. So in the end, I sort of told her a bit about the family history. Yeah. And she'd done some tests and I've got the same thing. And is this 2020, 20, Roughly 2021, yes. Oh, yep. Okay. And um, you have some savings from your businesses and work. Yeah, business, over sold a house and whatever. Yep. Right. You've never yourself lived in public housing? Never. All right. Um, can I take you to um, the time of the floods? I think you said at the time you were living at your sister's. Yes. Now, your sister had at the time, didn't she, or thereabouts, a, a, a lease on that property? It was an ex-partner's property, wasn't it? Yeah, so she lived in a little unit over East Lismore. So I moved in and lived there for a little while. Then the house, she was sort of grew up with her kids in. Uh, her and her ex-husband, they're not really married, they're not married, but her, her ex-partner yeah. had a house. He's moved out, so she moved into that house. All right. She's got a lease on that house, and I moved in to live with her, and that gave the two girls, the daughters, I suppose, opportunity to get on with their life. And One of the daughters, so your niece, her daughters, they they subsequently bought that. They bought the house two weeks before the flood. Yep. I see. All right. And is, was that for security for their mum? Yes. for my Basically, my the two girls moved out of home. I stayed there to look after my sister to sort of help care for her a bit. Yeah. Um, then the floods came. One daughter bought the house two weeks before the flood. They can give security for a mum, I suppose. But since the flood, now they've lost all their houses, so they've all moved back into that house. Because it was in, and we'll come to that, won't we? And I know you've provided a photo for the benefit of the commissioners, a photo of the property, property yep. at the height of the floods. Yes, yep. Um, she is an NDIS participant as yes. well. Yes, yep. And the house, when you were living it in February, it, had, it was accessible for you. Oh, it was good for me because my sister lived there. She had a what they call a wet bathroom, yeah, like a wet room. Everything was open, easy wheelchair access. Yeah, there was a back deck with ramps. So while I was living there, it was handy for me. And you were able to use it. Is it one? Was it? Is it one level or two levels? No, it's like six foot in the air. You can park underneath it. It's raised off the ground. Your house is up in on stilts. Yeah. Like a number of houses. Yes, oh, all of them are. Yeah, pretty well. All right. How how far off the ground would the floor of the kitchen be? Oh, I can stand up underneath it. Right. So six six foot. Um, in 2021, you applied to become an NDIS participant. Yep. Uh, around February, March. Does that yeah, it was early in the year, yes. Do you recall how long it, it took to get confirmation of November? The, November, all right. And um, you describe in your statement process of doing, doing that. How did you find, firstly, well, how did you know about, well, did you know about the NDIS from your sister? I knew about NDIS because of my sister. But how to get onto it, I wasn't sure because it was COVID around. So I'd done everything by telephone. Right. And I think it might not have been November, probably September, October, I was approved. Yeah. And then I had a first, after I got approved, they said, you've got to get an OT and a plan manager. So I got a plan manager, I got an OT. They come around to sort of check on me, I suppose, to see what was wrong with me. Where were you living then? At my sister. With your sister. And she realised then that the funding or whatever, the plan was just not suitable. Yeah. So that's all been getting muck around with all sort of November, December, January. At that time, and just probably Trevor, stepping back a bit, were you using a wheelchair? Uh, no, I've sort of had my sister's scooter. Right. At that time, I just felt like I had a broken foot. Yep. Uh, I had that broken foot in November, and then I broke it again in December. In the OT. You're talking 2020? Last year. Okay. Yeah, only last year. Only last year, November 2021. So, yeah, I think I was only just, yeah, only last year I got on the NDIS, I think it was, beginning of last yeah. year. So you didn't have a wheelchair then? No, I just earlier used, this year. used my sister's scooter because she doesn't use it anymore. She now can't sort of get on the scooter. Yeah. So her scooter, so I used to use it just to jot around the house and just ignored my own problems because I thought, got the scooter and scooted down to the car and go do what I got to do. I see. Did, did you have any face-to-face -face contact with in applying for the NDIS? No. All right. Um, and you talked about a plan manager. Um, did you have face-to-face -face contact with them? Were they in the region? No. When they said that you've got a, a plan for NDIS, whatever it is, I've got to get a plan manager, which is the lady that pays the bills, yep. if I get a support worker, and I had to get an OT to do an occupational therapist sort of to do a report on what my disabilities are. 
Yep. And that's the only lady I met was the OT. The OT. And they were in the region? She lived at Suffolk's Park, like 20 minutes away. All right. Um, you, your first plan was, I think, in October last? September, October, yes. September, October. Um, and do you recall in it, and it, for the benefit of uh, the Royal Commission, a copy of it is behind hearing bundle A3, tab 9. Um, do you recall in that document or prior to that talking to the NDIS people you spoke to about, um, about your goals? Yeah, I really only speak to my OT. Or, She's the one that does the plan, find out what my goals are and yeah. finds out what sort of funding I need to reach it, I suppose. Can I read you an extract from that document, which is your first uh, first plan, which for reference is dated, the document is dated 21 October 2021. Um, my goals, medium or long-term goal, during this plan, I would like to look for suitable housing options so that I can work towards living independently. Yep. Does that sound? That's exactly true. Yeah, there was th I had three goals. Stay independent, find somewhere to live and give up smoking. All right. In the same document, um, there's a, a part, and it's the page before this, um, that talks about my profile. And just if I can just read it to you, and again, is this a good summary of the context at the time? I live with my sister, yep, uh, her name, uh, in her privately rented home in Lismore, northern New South Wales. My daughter lives locally. Um, she supports me to access the community for activities like grocery shopping and appointments. I have lots of friends in the community with whom I attend community events and enjoy spending time. Yep. I'll come back to that, but community and family and connection with Lismore is something very, very important to you. Oh, yes, yes. Yep. All right. Because you've been there 40 odd years, am I right? My life, everything's there. All right. Um, you were allocated a support coordinator once you were, were on the NDIS plan, correct? Once I got the plan review, they got the very first plan, the OT done a review. Yeah. It wasn't acceptable, so I got a new plan. And that's when I got a support coordinator. Did, did the OT review it and think that you needed that some? Well, I didn't have funding there for a support coordinator. Right. It's like it was a manage. I was going to manage it all myself, but I didn't know how to. So when she done the review, she got a support coordinator funding for a support coordinator, and that's who I go through now. Right. Um, in your statement, you 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 say you're unhappy with the support coordination. Absolutely. Yep. What what can we talk? I'll split it up here. Pre pre flood. Um, it, might, it might be the same pre pre flood or post flood, but yep. prior to the floods, what were you unhappy about? Well, there was nothing, nothing to really be unhappy about then because I'd only just got on the NDIS. Yeah, they said they'd get me a scooter because my sister's scooter that I was using was breaking all the time. They'd organise a scooter, they'd organise a few things, and I didn't have to worry about people coming because I can't stand up at all. I've slowly gotten worse. I can't stand up and make a cup of tea. But I, I can manage it. Like, I can sit in a wheelchair and do it. It's just things like meals and stuff like that. Yeah. Someone had come and cook, say, one night a week. But I never really used it because I lived with my sister. I didn't need it. So up until the flood, I was pretty right. I could sort of get around the house. I could use the bathroom. I could use the kitchen. Once the flood came, there was just no support. Right. Absolutely none. Okay. I haven't had a physio this year. Yeah. I'm supposed to go every week. And what contact have you had with the support coordinator None. since then? The, they ring me and it's just, can't help you. Right. They just do nothing. Do they offer anything to catch up or what have you? No. Right. I'm still waiting on appointments now for a hydrotherapist I booked in February. I think you talk about that in your statement. There was a hydrotherapist you got referred to. Yeah. Can you tell the <clears throat> Royal Commission about that? Uh, I went to the hydrotherapist up at what the place that they call GSAC, like Ganella Bar Sports and Aquatic Centre. And I got up there to meet somebody, I think his name was, say, let's say, Terry, for example. When I got there, there's no such bloke. I spoke to another bloke who was only a young fella, and he said, oh, Terry's just an office worker. And my idea was to find out what they wanted to do with me. Like, do I go in this swimming pool in a group? Or do I go by myself? Does he get in with me, or does he sit on the sideline? Or... And he sort of didn't give me much confidence. He knew what he was doing. Yeah. So I asked him, I said, what experience have you got with muscular dystrophy? And what exercise will you give me for my back? And his answer was, I don't know, I'll Google it. So I lost faith instantly. I just didn't go. And was that appointment set up by through your NDIS through my planners, support, yep. support coordinator? And that was prior to the floods? That was prior to the floods. That was in February. I then left there and went to the university because they've got like a fitness place there. Yeah. And I thought, well, I'm not going to go there. He's just 
He's not going to give me exercise that's going to do more damage. I'll go to this place at the uni and I'll just do it myself. Uh, but when I got there, that's the, just a big, deep pool. And I'm a bit worried I'm not a good swimmer. So I went back to my providers, my support coordinator, and asked her to sort of book me in places, see what she can find. And I've asked probably four or five times now. You're still waiting. I even said, I'm now laying, staying in Ballina for a week or two. Maybe someone in Ballina can get me in. I've never had a phone call from her. I see. Um, there's a part of your statement, and I want to read it to you, because um, I think it encapsulates probably what the frustration you're express, expressing. Uh, at paragraph 100, for the benefit of reference, you say, tell me if this has changed. I don't understand how the NDIS works. Uh, I don't know what to ask for. I totally got no idea. I don't know what they can help me with or provide. Uh, you say, I don't need a scooter because I've got nowhere to go. That's now yep. correct. I don't need a mattress because I've got no bed to put it on. Yep. I don't need my bathroom fixed because I've got no bathroom to fix, to be fixed. I need a place to live. That's about you. Uh, and you say that's it. <laughs> oh, it'll be um, a good start. If I had a place to live, then my support coordinator could probably help me. Yes. Um, she could help me make my bathroom accessible, get me a scooter, get me some technology to assist, whatever I need for my disability. But until then, I don't see the point in meeting her. Well, look, yeah, if I was in my own place, I could get someone to come and cook two nights a week, prep meals, put them in the freezer. But yep. I don't even have a freezer. But... And do you have in your NDIS plan, to your knowledge, funding for those sorts of supports at the moment? I'm not aware. From what I'm aware of, no. Right. I've got a new review being done now because after the flood, they were supposed to do a change of circumstances. Yep. That was in February. I only just nagged to my support work the other month and it finally got done probably four weeks ago. A change of circumstances. It's apparently is getting done. All right. Did you have to chase up about that? How did I've you had find to do all of it? That's just done nothing. All right. I actually found other people with other services that told me about it, so they've done it for me. Right. You've you've, you've learned it that way. In uh, 2017, you were in you, you were in well, you were in the floods in Lismore. Yes. Yep. Um, and so you had a I guess working up to these floods, but you had an expectation then about what a flood might look like. Oh, yeah, I've been through lots of floods in Lismore. Yeah. In preparing for the, in the days or so before this flood, you were at your sister's in South Lismore. Yes. Um, both you and her, uh, were you using a wheelchair at the time? Uh, no, I didn't have one, right. just a scooter. Your sister, though? She was fully, can't move. She's, she used an electric wheelchair? She's got an electric wheelchair. We hoist her in and out of bed. And, all right. Um, you talk in your statement about fire and rescue or, or the SES yep. coming along down the street. Was it was it fire and rescue or SES? Do you uh, both fire. And, there was a fire engines and SES people. I'm used to the floods. I'm on the other side of the river. Yeah. And the AI is going to be 12 metres. I sort of know how deep it's going to get. Yeah. This time I'm over at my sister's place and we're unaware. And in 2017, they got a flood. It was sort of, it hit the bumper bars on my car. So that was in 2017. Yeah. This year come along and I'm, so I'm actually in South Lismore when the flood's coming. I thought, oh, this would be sort of a bit excitement, like, you know, water everywhere. The fireys and the SES come along and they asked if people are staying in the house or are you evacuating? And I said, we're staying because they put a ribbon on the letterbox and I said, what's that for? They said, so we can come down and we can see if someone's living in the house, they've got the ribbon on it. If it's no ribbon, it means the house is empty. We don't have to go check on them. Yeah. So we figured because they're putting it on the letterbox, the water can't be getting any deeper than that or they won't be able to see it. Was there any... Did you speak with those? I spoke to that, Blake's, yes. Um, was there any discussion about any other evacuation or any other plans? For no, basically, are you staying or are you going? All right. And I thought, well, if the water's only going to get that deep and I'm six foot, seven foot in the air, why would we leave? Like, so that was what you were thinking at the time? That's what we were thinking. I just moved my car over to higher ground and went over and went to bed. And that's what you did, didn't you? That's what we done, you yeah. Moved it up. Um, can I take you then to the night of the flood? And again, yep. if... If it gets difficult, yeah, that's all right. I want to answer your question, please. Yep. This is about you and your evidence, not about my questions to you. Um, in your in your statement, you talk about waking up at about two a.m. Your sister pressed her alert button. Yeah, my sister's got like a door button, like you buy from Bunnings, a doorbell, and the button the ringer goes somewhere else in the house. Yeah. So if she's in trouble because she's on a machine to breathe, if the power goes off or any or the mask falls off. She can't breathe, I suppose. So she presses a button, we run to her help. Yeah. The night of the flood, that went off. So I jumped up to see if she's all right. And she was having a panic attack because her niece or her daughter lives up the hill saying, oh, mum, you've got to get out. It's going to be a big flood. And 
She was texting and ringing. She was texting and ringing, and me and my sister were there thinking, it's only going to get this deep. Like, she's just been young and childish, sort of, so we didn't worry about it. And her, just for context, the ex, her ex-partner was living out in the bus. In He's the in a bus out in the backyard. Right, yep. okay. What, um, at that time, could you see where the water was? Well, I got my sister. I said, what's up? And she goes, oh, I'm just having a panic attack. I said, well, you want me to make a cup of tea? She goes, I can't. Like, she can't have a cup of tea. But I said, I'll get you up. We'll have a cup of tea. Like, so I went and put the kettle on, went out the back and had a look, and there was water on the grass. I thought, geez, I didn't expect to see any till the next day. Like, probably only so deep. Yeah. Went inside, got my, put the kettle on, got my sister out of bed, got her into the kitchen, made a cup of tea, went out the back, and the water was about that deep. Yeah. In the matter Showing of about, what, two minutes? Oh, one and a half to two. Ten minutes. minutes. Ten minutes max. Ten minutes. Right. Boil the kettle, get her out of bed. It was sort of that day. We had cut like a six foot colour bond fence. Yep. It was probably that far from the top of it. Foot or so. In about 15 minutes. All right. Um, and I think, again, for the benefit of the Royal Commission, you provided a photo of your sister on the bench. Yes. Because yep. you and the, um, her ex partner. Yes. Eventually the water comes inside, correct? Yes, yeah, it, it got inside, yes. And you put it on the kitchen bench. Put it on the kitchen bench, open up the knife and fork door to stick feet in. Yeah. Um, and just kept ringing for help. Okay. Did, in your statement, you say you tried calling the SES. Did you get Heaps through? Heaps of times. Did you get uh, No, what? not the SES. We you... tried triple O, got through to them. All right. And what did they say to you when, you when you got through to them? Put my sister on the roof. That was it. And did you, you got to get her up on the roof. You've got to get up on the roof. I said, I can't. I'm in a wheelchair. But, uh, we just rang over and over and over. Triple O? And, and did you speak to them another time? Heaps. They just said they're going to wait. We'll talk you through it till you die. Yeah. Are you right, Con? Yeah. All right. They just said, we'll keep you company till the end. Well, she said, on a cupboard. So there was yourself, her ex-partner, and um, obviously your sister. Now, yep. you, you, you contacted your niece or your sister? I contacted my niece because they were just ringing up, just trying to get help. Like We ripped doors off the house and put across the back verandas on the railings just to try to get something to get higher and up. And water's out. up to the railings. Up to the yeah. And I just rang up my niece and said, you've got to go down to the water line, wherever the help is, and just... Just go stupid. Just yeah, make like the biggest scene ever because we're going under sort of the wheelchairs underwater. It's just, just coming up the, this deep. And, and her CPAP machine, a breathing machine was... It's stuck up on top of the microwave trying to keep it dry. Because did she, she still needed it? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. She couldn't... Yeah, she can't breathe without it. Then you are rescued. Eventually, yeah. Bloke in a little boat, a little tinny sort of wet... He's going around Lismore. There's only one boat in the whole of South Lismore. A little boat with about an eight horsepower motor on it. And I don't know, he must live over near my niece because my niece is up on the roof of her house and she's screaming at him, go and get my mum. She's in a wheelchair. And he come looking for us and couldn't find us. Yeah. Then he went back and she's yelled at him again. And he's come around the back in the boat, put my sister in it, got her to the school. And he just went around all night. School was evacuation point, was it? No, it was just the only place we could see that was high. Right. So we just kicked the doors open and um, he just went from one house to the next, just picking people up. And did your sister go, did you stay, did you stay behind? while? Oh, they took my sister first. Yeah. And one of the blokes, there was two blokes in the rescue boat, just a little tinny. Uh, one bloke stayed with me. My sister and her ex-boyfriend went around to the school. Then the bloke come back to get his partner. So I've jumped in the boat and they took me around there as well. All right. But that's the only boat in the whole of South Lismore pretty well till sunrise. That's two in the morning till about six in the morning. And you, at the time, your foot was broken? Yes. Um, and I think in your statement, you say you, you've had no wheelchair, no crutches, no nothing. No, your no mobile problem. phone, I think, was gone. All no, I did have a mobile, but it was flat. So. Yeah. And you say, I just sat at the bottom of the hill. I didn't know where to go. After Well, that's after we got out of the school. There was another drama. Then we were rescue boats. And- where did you go after the school? Uh, the police just basically put on the radio, we need help, and people turn up from everywhere. More, more boats. Boats, jet skis. And your sister went to the hospital, did she? We, yes. Yeah, we jumped in at the school, went past her house to pick her next-door neighbour up because yep. we saw her on Facebook saying goodbye. Yeah. She was on a stepladder up to about here in water. Up to her neck, yeah. Facebook and just saying goodbye to everybody. She's about to step off the ladder. Um. Got my sister to the bottom of the school after we had an incident in the boat, got sort of swept up yeah. into a tree. And You talk about in your statement, 
and how a jet ski, I think, almost yeah, crashed into crashed, it. Yeah, he crashed into it as well. We got her to the bottom of the hill and they just dragged my sister out and put her in a, I don't know, some four-wheel drive and just took off to the hospital. And yeah. I just sat at the bottom of the hill with a bag with some clothes in it and a sore foot. You are right? Yeah, yeah. Your statement, you talk about, you say the first six weeks after the flood are a bit like a blur. Yeah, I can't even tell you where I was yeah. saying half the time. Um, uh, you had contact with the recovery centre? Yes, I went. To, that's where everybody was saying, go to the recovery centre. But And were you able to get support from them or what did they recommend? No, it took me a couple of days to get there because I was just struggling to get around, sleeping in my car or whatever. You had your car, didn't you? Yeah. I had my car because it was out of the flood. I uh, borrowed some clothes off a mate of mine. But you go to this recovery centre and it's just, I ended up getting crutches. So it's all a blur now. I know that I got my wheelchair I'm about the ninth because my OT turned yeah, up. The OT helped you with that. She, cause I was supposed to get this in December and it never took, I never got one. Yeah. And then because of the flood come, I had no crutches. I went to the hospital and got crutches. My OT rang me and said, I've got you a wheelchair, but that was on the ninth. So prior to that, I don't really know how many times I went to the rescue centre. Yep. Although it's not a rescue centre. Recovery centre. Recovery centre at the uni. But um, Did they, rec they, they refer you to the start at the uni university for it? No, that was my support coordinator. Support coordinator. Did. I'm ringing up asking for help. And she just, well, she, no, she didn't ring me at first. It took probably a week before I spoke to her. And was that you ringing her or they rang you? Um, I was ringing her at the end. But her advice was just go sleep at the uni because I've just got like a... Basketball stadium with mattresses all over the floor. And what did you find when you went there? No room to move, just people scattered everywhere. And what about facilities, bathrooms, showers? I couldn't get to them. There was just, it's like here with 550 mattresses just thrown on the table. Like, yeah. But 10 times bigger. Than, I don't even know where the bathrooms were there. I couldn't get through the place. I see. So that wasn't somewhere you could stay? No, I couldn't stay there, no. Okay. And then COVID broke out there within two days later anyway. I think you, you were even talking with Service New South Wales and Asking them if you could sleep in there. I asked if I could. I told them I was going to sleep on the floor in their offices, but they threatened it. security will just push the wheelchair out. You were desperate. I was desperate. I offered to go to the hospital and push down the steps, yeah, just to get some somewhere to sleep. Um, in early April, you got wind that the premier was coming to Lismore. Ah, uh, yes. I didn't know he was coming, but I found him in Lismore. Yes. You found him. You chance to. Pop. I found him. Yeah. Uh, and you approached him, didn't you? And yes. And yeah, sort of. <clears throat> I was trying to get all this help, and there was a lady by the name of Janelle Stafford. She's sort of some local member of the local. parliament, someone up there. There's a few up there, so I went looking for her. Yeah. And I went past the old Lismore post office and saw a couple of real flash, expensive Range Rovers there and people in suits. Yeah. And one was Dominic. So and you, you I went up and had little words with him, yes. And, and what happened as a result of that conversation? Uh, I wasn't real polite to him, but that night I got a motel room to sleep in. All right. Was Who organised that, do you know? His secretary. All right. And we're talking now, aren't we? This is early April, about this week is probably before Easter. Five weeks after the flood, yeah. yeah. So in that it was month, Easter, I think, because that's the, the day I found out. Everybody that was staying in the pubs and sort of like, they all got motel rooms to stay in, up in Ganella Bar, Ballina, and be, because it was holiday season... They had to move them. So they sent them all up to the Gold Coast and gave them all petrol money, spending money to go up the Gold Coast. When you say holidays, is that because, as you understood it, because, no, holiday because rentals? Holiday rentals in Ballon, like someone had booked a motel room, all of a sudden there's a flood victim living in there. Well, they had to get out. So the government, or I don't know, someone organised, send them all up to the Tweed Heads and give them more motel rooms and give them all spending money to get up there. And I'm struggling to find somewhere to sleep. So that's when I went downtown and saw Dominic. Um, can I, at the time, is it right in terms of you, you had some ability to stand for a little bit and walk yes. some steps? I still can. I can probably still can. get to the door, but yeah. I wouldn't go much further than that door. All right. Can I, you've, you've provided this to the solicitor assisting, I'll walk through it, but just to get a picture of the temporary accommodation and where you lived from that date, am I right that you were first at Tweed Heads? Is that right? First at Tweed Heads. For 18 days. Approximately, Approximately 18 days, I'd say, yep. You might know this off the top of your head without Ballina next for a week. Yeah, yes. Uh, Ballina Caravan Park. That, that was into a proper disabled That was accessible. That was perfect. Yeah, 26 days. 26 days or 28 days, that was it. Was that, though, where you would... The more holidays. Couldn't find anything to cook, though? 
Sorry? Was that where you couldn't, didn't have cooking facilities? No, all the other places I had no cooking facilities. Right. They put me up in the Tweed Heads, steps, bathroom I couldn't use, no cooking facilities. Then they moved me from there to another place in Ballina, nowhere to cook. They had a fridge, but the fridge is like only this big. Tiny. Um, then they put me in a disabled cabin in Ballina for 26 days, I think it was. Yeah. Which was perfect, but holidays coming, so I had to get out again. And then you, I think after that, for a week, you're at a motel in Ballina. Week in motel in Ballina. Then they moved me from room seven to room 10. So still same, same yeah, just up, motel. Just nowhere else for me to stay. Then right. they moved me to another motel down the street yeah. for probably six days. Then they moved me down to Evans Head. Evans Head, 10 days. 10 days. Then I had to go back to Ballina for, well, I thought it was another week, but when I got there, the council, booking was cancelled. Yeah. Can I just pause you there for a minute? You were being contacted by someone to tell you where next to move or did you ring or how did, how did, how did you know where to go? Or what? After I left, I don't know. When I got to Tweed Heads, <clears throat> I kept coming down to Lismore to see my sister because she was put straight into hospital after the floods. That's- and I just kept going to the rescue, rescue centre, whatever you call it, like for the recovery centre. Recovery centre. And they said, ring up four days before you're due to get out. So I had to get out of that place in 18 days. Yeah. So on the 14th day, I rang them and they said they could extend it. Except mine, they couldn't extend it. They just kept moving it. They'd tell you where to, where yes. to go. And once I was in, when I went to Evans Head, they said, you got a week in this motel, <clears throat> six days in this motel, you go to Evans Head for a week, then you go to this motel for a week. At the end of that, well, then I just ring up again, I suppose. Um, I don't know where I'm going next. And so where are you now? I'm at Lennox Head at the moment. All right. I'm there till the 9th. After that, I've got no idea. 9th of September. Yeah. And how long have you been there? Uh, I was there for 24 days. Yeah. But because I was coming here, I rang up early and they got me in for another till, till the 9th. Okay. I was supposed to be out. Well, I got a text message yesterday saying, Hope I enjoyed my stay. So I'm hoping all my stuff's still in the room when I get back. All right. And I think there's another Tweed Heads property in between for 10 There was days one not long ago, yes. Prior to that. But they've got, there's bathrooms I can't even use. That one, my last one at Tweed Heads, I was there like 14 days with no showers. Um, and are those places, obviously none of them are in Lismore, but are they, no. do you know people in those areas or family? No, no nobody. And then has, has that been a struggle for you? Well, I've got no support. I've got nothing. I've got no way of cooking food. Yep. There was no kitchen in any of them. They got a fridge the size of that, like the freezer's the size of that. And I got a bathroom I can't use. There's just nothing there. Did you ask your support coordinate, coordinator for to assist the purchase of an air fryer on one occasion? Yes. Yeah. What, no, what happened then? Refuse. It's not in my funding. Why did you ask for that though? So I could eat. I'm sick of living on LCM bars in one of the, sandwiches in one of those temporary accommodations. In one of these motels, all I got is a little a microwave, a kettle, and a toaster. Right. So I'm sick of say, eating sandwiches. So I asked for an air fryer and they said, no, it's not in my funding. But what she will do is send someone all the way out from Lismore to cook for me and go all the way back home again. So it's an hour's drive, cook me for an hour, then drive home three hours. They're willing to pay someone three hours, but couldn't get me an air fryer. Right. I said, well, well I'll do that then, but I don't know where you're going to send this person up to cook. There's, no, there's nowhere to cook. And that was, part of, that, that was part of the funding they said that was... I'm entitled to get someone to come and cook for me, yes. Right. But they... They're willing to send someone on a three-hour journey to my place to cook me food when I don't even have an oven. Yeah. But they wouldn't get me let me get an air fryer. There are some emergency pods that are being built. Yes. In various areas. One, some in Wollong Bar. Wollong Bar is the main one. Yeah. Uh, what What do you know about those? Are you? I've applied for it all. Yeah. But apparently, there's none for disabled people. People with what they call special needs. All right. And and who who informed you of that? Who's New South Wales Services. Right. They sent me text messages. Okay. But to your understanding, you're still on a waiting list or you don't know? I'm pretty sure I'm on a waiting list. According to the last text message I got them, I'm on the waiting list. Right. Um, I'd like to ask you some questions about some statements that some of the government agencies have provided. I'll read them to you. I yep. might put them on the screen. Yep. Just to see and ask you a question about your experience. The first one, for the benefit of reference, is it's from the um, State Government, Department of Communities and Justice, just for your reference. It's behind hearing bundle A2, tab 16, uh, and it's page 38 of 46, which is paragraph 195. 
let me read you parts of this and just ask you whether it's been your experience. Yep. Um, the department provides and manages a suite of housing assistance options to support those affected by the floods, which include one, initial 28 days emergency accommodation for any persons displaced by the floods with consideration for an additional 28 days dependent upon the person's needs and circumstances. It sounds like once you spoke to the Premier, that perhaps something like that is the... Well, that's it. That getting. was 28 days, and if I need it, they'll extend it for another 28 days. Yeah. That's never happened to me yet, but right. I did get 20... I'd, I'd say I would have got the 28 days once I spoke to the Premier, yeah. Um, rent start assistance up to four weeks, bond loan and two weeks advance rent into the private rental market. Got no idea what that is. On that topic of private rental market, um, you're on the DSP, um, disability support. Yes, rent. yep. How much is, is that for you every fortnight, roughly? Uh, $940-something dollars a fortnight. And if you currently, if, have you looked at whether private rental is an option for you? There's absolutely nowhere. There would be nowhere in Lismore. There'd be nowhere on the North Coast. It costs you $250 just for a bedroom in a house. Right. I couldn't, I couldn't afford that now. All right. Um, three, short-term accommodation at sports and recreation camps in three locations, um, camp, camp Canonia, Lake Ainsworth, Short and Recreation Centre and Camp Drew, all approximately 40 kilometres from Lismore. Have you been to any of those? No, but that's like that one you just went at uh, Lake Ainsworth? Yeah. They, since they found out I was coming to the Royal Commission, everyone's jumping up and down trying to help me now. And they rang me up and talked about that place. When you say they, do you know who? Uh, department, indeed. Oh, I've got my phone. I can tell you what it was. Department of Housing. Department of Housing or Department? Department of Housing, yes. I see. Right. And when, was, when, were that, when did you receive that call? Thursday. Thursday. Thursday, that just went to like four or five days ago. Okay. We're effective. <laughs> uh, the problem with it is, but they've got it, like, it's not suitable. And I don't know how to say no to them. Right. I can't say no and be ungrateful. But there's, I can't say this. You, you speak in your statement to, um, I won't take the other parts of that, but there are some other parts, in fairness, to the department. You talk about at the recovery centre um, seeking their assistance and then making some calls. You talk about them referring to you as a person with special needs. Yeah, I've asked them so that. many times not to. Why as is soon that? as they say special needs, you don't get looked after. Right. Oh, you can't stay in... I said, just give me anywhere. I don't care. I'll make do. But they don't because you've got special needs. Oh, you've got to have a ground floor. They're talking about sending me to Dorigo. That's a three and a half hour drive. Right. And I've got, what do you do in Dorigo? Yeah. I've got no support. I've got no transport. I've got absolutely nothing. But as soon as you say special needs, it's, oh, you've got to have this, you've got to have that. So you're kind of, you're, caught, you're in a narrower, narrower, a narrower gap. Yeah. Um, Colin, if, uh, one question in terms of the NDIS since the floods. Have you um, been referred or have you heard of the phrase complex support needs pathway? Is that something that's come up for you? No. All right. That's not something your support coordinators talk to you about? I don't talk to my support coordinators. I, just, I ring her, I can never get through to her and she never rings me. I've now been, I had to ring up a support coordinator the other day concerning some stuff. And they put me through a new person. I said, are you my support coordinator? Oh, I'm just helping out the other one. I said, oh, I'd prefer to stick with the other one so she can do a job. But I don't know at this moment who my support coordinator is. Awesome. They just pushed me aside. You describe in your statement that you feel like you've been living in limbo. Do you still feel like you're living in limbo? Yep. Because yep. you don't know where you're living after. I don't know if my stuff's still in the place where I was sleeping two days ago or whether it's packed in the car ready for me to leave. If you could uh, wave a wand and seek some suitable long-term housing, yep. what, what, what would you do at the moment? Uh, what, what have you thought of doing? I'd like to buy a place, but you can't get a loan. I'm in a wheelchair and I'm on a pension, so I can't borrow money, I suppose. Because you have some savings. I've got some savings. If I could borrow $50,000, I'd be off the system. Right. I'd have my own place to stay. I could do it. 
and I can pay the loan off. It's just you can't get a loan. Can't get a loan. Yeah, I've got enough money almost to buy a unit. If I can borrow fifty thousand dollars, I can set myself up. I'm off the system. I'm on NDIS. I can sort that out and sort of hopefully get some support. I'm off the system and I'm all good. But until then, I'll be still doing this in a year's time. That's your fear. I've got no debt. If I can't get the money, I'll be just living in my car or living in caravan parks. Before I hand over to the commissioners to, to ask you questions, um, in your statement, you've shared some recommendations and ideas for reform. I just want to walk through those with you. Yep. Um, firstly, you say better emergency planning and first responding for people with disability during and after a natural disaster or public emergency. Yep. That's so? Yes, definitely. You didn't feel there was adequate preparation? I got nothing. I got, didn't even get a phone call for about seven days. And that's, so that's responding after it? That was after the flood. Like that was, and that was just from a support worker. Yep. Basically, I don't think, I'm not even sure if, I, if she rang me or I rang her, but it was at least a week later before I spoke to a support coordinator and that would have been the only person. Recovery centres need to be accessible and staff need training on helping people with disability? Yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. It's, I went to one bloke up there. They had sort of like, as you walked in, they had the Red Cross and they had like Department of Housing and they had some busy ability people and, and that was people for disability people. So I went up and asked them for some help and I mentioned my OT and he didn't even know what an OT was. Right. And he's supposed to be in the NDIS. I uh, went to the housing department area, filled in all the paperwork, went there two days later, they sent me out the back to fill the paperwork in. They, apparently it hasn't been done. To this day, it still hasn't been filled in. I've done it probably four times. I've got them ringing me up this week to fill in an application for the Department of Housing. And I've done that in February. Yeah. I think you also, at one point, you talk in your statement about uh, a form for a grant to assist the South Lismore home. Yep. What happened with that? Uh, I got the paperwork to fill in because I had no glasses. I was struggling to read it. I asked the lady at the thing about if I can borrow her glasses. At the recovery centre. At the recovery centre. And she goes, well, I need them, but we'll get this bloke to help you. He was a paramedic, off-duty paramedic, helping people do the forms. We filled it in, got to the next page. And he said, you got money in the bank? I said, yeah, you just... Through the piece said you're wasting your time. Right. He sent me the legal aid to a pipe to appeal against it before it was denied. He said, You will not get approved. So they sent me then to legal aid because they were going to reject it. I said, Well, I can't go until they've rejected it. Like, but I had money in the bank, so I'm not allowed to class for anything. I see. You also suggest recommendations that after a natural disaster or emergency, NDIS should have the capacity to know which participants have been affected. They should know that already, should, I believe. should contact them. They should know that already. They should know who many people live in South Lismore. And you, in your, your experience is that that's, your impression is they haven't with you? No, they've, they've done nothing, no. You say also that NDIS should permit more flexible use of funds post-disaster or emergency? Yep. And again, that's reflective of your experience. Oh, just some way of cooking food. Yeah. Uh, you say support coordinators should be proactive. Yes. Uh, and more accessible emergency housing accommodation for people with disability. I don't know how you fix that problem, but there's definitely nothing out there for them. But that's the starkest for you at the moment, isn't yes. it? Yes. Yeah. All right. Then also the last recommendation in your statement is essentially that there should be a designated person to help a person with disability after a natural disaster or public emergency yes. to navigate the systems. It'd be nice for someone like if I, I know I've got a support worker or a support coordinator, I should be able to ring up her and say, say I need help with all this paperwork and send someone that can help you sort of guide you through it because the paperwork's impossible. Have you asked them for that before? Um, I have actually, yes. They sent some lady down that played on a mobile phone. Right. So she got paid for three hours, 20 minutes work. Colin, that's the list of recommendations. I don't want to run out of time. For that's all right. I'm sure that I have some questions. Thank you so much that's for right. sharing no that and, and, and assisting the Royal Commission. Sure. No worries. Colin, yes, thank you very much. If it's okay with you, I'll ask uh, my colleagues if they have any questions yep. for you. I'll first ask Commissioner Galbally, whom you can see on screen, whether she has any questions. I think you might be on mute, uh, Commissioner. Colin, thank you very much indeed. Um, it's, That's all right. It's, a, it's harrowing um, hearing what happened and the complete 
lack of any response to you. Um, so the just... Just I would like to ask you more about the lo the loan that you feel would um, make you completely independent. So you've been to banks? Uh, I haven't. You just sort of know that you've got to be able to sort of be able to uh, pay the loan back. That's yeah. the biggest problem. If I go to buy it to rent a place, I can get rent assistance and I could probably get a place to rent for, what, $200 a week? The rent assistance will pay the rest of it? If someone could just give me that and I'll pay the back $200 a, lo a week. It's just that there's no loans out there for people that don't work. Yeah, yeah. So so would that go into your list of recommendations too? Um, because you, you could be pay idea. the loan yeah, back, definitely. as you said. You you can pay yes. the loan back. But the, there's you just I can't. I can definitely pay the, the loan back but if I could get one. Yeah. And until I get one, I'm just going to be on this bandwagon. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's all right. I'll ask Commissioner Ryan whether he has any questions. Yeah, thanks, Mr Chair. Colin, can I ask you about your support coordinator? Are they operating on their own or are they part of a larger organisation? They're part of a very large organisation. Okay. How did you find them and choose them? I worked for them for five years. I thought they were brilliant until I got into trouble. Okay. And they're absolutely useless. When, when you engaged them, did you have to sign a contract? Or yes. Something? Yep. Did they have a meeting with you to sign the contract? I had a meeting with a support coordinator and just signed like... When I first went there, my plan wasn't actually done. I had a, I had a plan done and then my OT saw me and said, this plan's not good enough, we're going to have to do a review. So she's done a review for a new plan and she said, well, I'm also going to put in for a support coordinator because you've got no funding there for a support coordinator. So I went to this company and the support coordinator there said that she will do it pro rata till this is approved. So it was probably a month later I then signed the paperwork. So as a side matter, they assisted you in changing your plan, but pretty much only to the extent that they got funding for themselves. They do all of they do the funding, the spending, the bend of the bills. My support, my support coordinator company does the plan management, they do everything. Now I want you to try and remember when <clears throat> did whether you signed a contract with them. Did you sign a contract with them? I believe so, yes. And do you remember doing it? Yes. Did they explain to you what services they provide, how the contract works, how you can phone them up for assistance, what a support coordinator does? No. I thought I knew, so I just sort of didn't really ask the questions. Um, there was a couple of things I just asked questions about to curiosity, uh, but I thought I sort of knew how it went. I worked for them for ages, sort of. If I need someone to cook, I should be able to organise this or whatever. But so, I ring up my support coordinator and I don't know if it's me just not knowing enough or expecting something I'm not entitled to. I don't know, but I get no help. Well, I think just a phone call would be nice. Um, so they didn't explain to you what a, a, what services a support coordinator could provide? Not entirely, would, no. You said to us that you frequently ring them up and they never get back to you. Yes, did they ever invite you to make contact with them by email? Uh, well, I, they know I don't do emails because oh. I sort of not real good with the telephones. But I ring up and I speak to one person. Oh, that's... I ring up and all of a sudden get an answering machine. She doesn't work Mondays or Fridays. Oh, okay then. I'll ring up my team leader. I ring up my team leader. No, you're going to have to see your support coordinator about that. All right, leave it till tomorrow. Next, I ring up my support coordinator. No, 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 I've spoken to your team leader about that. that she'll sort that out. And it was all over... Nothing. It's five phone calls, six phone calls just to talk to somebody. And I can say my support coordinator has rang me no more than four times, probably since the flood. And I've been on the phone begging in tears for help. She's even wrote a letter back to me to ask me if I was uh, threatening suicide or self-harm. Um, she was that concerned. The very next thing, the phone's down. I never hear from her again. There's no follow-up. There's no duty of care. There's nothing. No. Um, well, thank you, Colin. I think that's very important information you've given the Royal Commission and speaks for itself. I've had lots of hassles since the flood, and that's just basically the flood and NDIS. Thank you for coming to the Royal Commission and telling us a very important story. I appreciate no, it. No worries. Colin, I think you mentioned that your sister had gone to the hospital. Yes. Uh, and that she was there. Is she still there? No, she's out now. She's out. She's back in the house. Right, so she's got that. So she's got accommodation 
before. Yeah, the, before my niece, her daughter bought the house just before the flood. It's now sort of been fixed up and my sister's back in there now. So the house has been restored. It's been fixed good enough for her to live in, yes. Right. Is it possible for you to go back there? There's no room. She's got both kids and her grandkids living there now. No, there's no room. For there's you. no room, no. I understand. I see. Um, you mentioned that you had some savings. Yes. Have you thought about or did you think about whether those savings could be used at least for a while in the private rental market or was there a problem? Well, I would use it there, but there's nowhere to rent. I see. There is nowhere. There's absolutely nowhere. Like, Department of Housing couldn't get you a motel room for one night in Lismore. So there's simply nothing. That there's you, nothing. Okay. They're talking about moving me to Dorigo because there's no motels in the area for emergency accommodation. Right. How far away from Lismore would you have to go to get rental accommodation? I don't know. I I really couldn't tell you because there's nothing. It's, it's just a nothing. big, massive, big shortage up there. All the way up to Tweed Heads went underwater. Like there's people at Tweed Heads that are homeless. Everything sort of. So the short answer is there's simply no accommodation. There's no way. That's why I can't be ungrateful. If they're going to put me in a place with a bathroom I can't use, yeah. I just take it. So either that or yeah. sleep in a storage shed or something. Well, I join with my colleagues in thanking you very much for giving evidence. You've given a very graphic account of what happened during the floods and your experiences afterwards. And uh, I know that's not an easy thing for you to do. No, it's not. Uh, and we appreciate very much that you've been prepared to do that. Give us a detailed statement and yep. answer the questions that Mr. Fogarty and the commissioners have put to you. We're very grateful. That's all right, no worries. Thank you so much. Mr. Fogarty, does that to conclude the proceeding? It does, thank today? you, Chair. So we should adjourn until 10 a.m. tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. That's all right. No worries. We'll adjourn until 10am tomorrow. The Royal Commission is adjourned.